Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 780. That is Siete Ocho Zero of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling, my friends and family? I hope you're well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered. I cannot lie. All good, all things considered. I've been, you know, kind of off the gym thing. I kind of haven't been on it as much as I was before. I've been going, I think last time I went maybe like four days ago. But I have been eating well. That's a strange thing. Strangely, I have been eating well. I have been hydrating. I've not been on the big back fat boy shit for the most part. And I'm doing okay. But I need to get back onto the gym thing. And that will be commencing later on tonight as I do a little double session. That's probably going to kill me. But it's a good way to get myself back into the swimming swing of things. But apart from that, everything's been fairly good on my end. I can't really complain and I hope you're well, wherever you may be. Number one topic to talk about. Number one, and this is my point of view. So don't kill me. Don't come at me in the comments. Don't give me flipping big DMs. I'm never going to open or read. Don't flipping give me horrible comments on the YouTube when I clip it up. Don't send me really mean emails. Just let me have my opinions, all right? God. I know I hammer you over the head with your my opinions. I know I don't let you breathe. I know it's a one-way conversation. Someone left me actually a very mean intended comment, but I just took it like a big boy, like, okay, constructive criticism. They were like, oh, this is like hearing somebody have a conversation with themselves, but on opposite ends of the argument. And you never really came to a conclusion. <laughs> I was like, wow. How are you going to hurt my feelings like that? And how are you also going to be so accurate in terms of how to read me? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yes, what do you expect? Everybody that does this sort of stuff has a mental illness, right? I'm currently sat in a room with no one around me, but I'm speaking like you're right in front of me. Of course I've got a mental illness. Of course I sound like I'm talking like some like there's two people in the room or I'm talking from two different perspectives, you know, but I'm the same person. Of course. I'm a content creator, YouTuber, podcaster, slash YouTube, plus fucking DJ. All those things, they require a, a, a tism, a sprinkling of mental illness. You can't do all those things and be, well, name me one person in your friendship group that has those things as their flipping jobs, job specification or their job, sorry, job occupation under their Instagram and tell me if they're normal or not. I bet you they're not. Name me, think of anybody you know in your own friendship group who is a flipping DJ, photographer, designer, content creator, influencer. Are they normal? Of course not. Why do you expect me to be normal then? I'm just as much as a freak as your friends. I just, I just live my truth. I am who I am, okay? It's not nice. Don't this, don't flicking hurt me with your words. It's not nice, as Brendan would say. It's not nice. Be nice to me, please. God damn. Honestly, it's like hearing an eight minute conversation between two different people that never come to a conclusion. I was like, whoa, whoa. Let's relax. Yo, yo. How you dare you read me like that, huh? Um, but it's interesting though, that people say that sort of stuff, stuff because it's proof to me anyway, at least, because I've got, a parasocial relationship with podcasters myself, other people that I listen to, right? And I, you can sometimes, I'm sure you guys have that too, you can sometimes read them very easily because you listen to them so much and they don't listen to you. You spend all your time listening to what they say. They have no idea who you are, but you're concentrating on the words that they say or the words that they don't, don't say or how they say them. So you can sometimes infer and sometimes speculate on motives or what they And usually you're right. But some podcasters, content creators hate that because they're so easy to read because you share so much of yourself on a pod. And I don't even share that much about myself. I usually just talk about the topics, but I don't really go too deep about my personal life. It's not really that interesting. Who gives a fuck? But people can still gauge who I am and what I'm about based on what I said. So I love that bit outside of it. It's like, wow, man, so much content I put out there. So many unnecessary clips I send out into deep space. Sometimes <laughs> someone's going to listen to it and think, yo, is this guy okay? Should this guy be on meds? Why is he on fucking YouTube? And to be honest anyway, to be honest anyway, to be honest anyway, it's a weird way to start this segment, by the way, but to be honest anyway, I had a revelation the other day when I was doing the random show. The random show is my number one, the premiere, the best, the number one com comedy 
commentary podcast in the world or live stream. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you go to my channel. It's on YouTube. Chap in my name. You'll find all the clips. They're sorted out in playlists. It's easy to find. But when I was doing a random show the other day, I actually came to a live res. I actually came to a ri live revolution re revelation in real time about unique. I was like, oh, the content creator unique. There was a time when I want to say I looked down on him, but there was a time where I kind of felt bad for the guy. I might have judged in my head, judged him in my brain because he'd get on live stream. He'd be on like prescription medication. He'd be drinking a loads and just being belligerent. Like you'd see it from the start of the stream. You could literally play it and then scrub your way to the end. And by the end, you could barely understand what you're saying because you're slurring his words. He was all marble mouthed. He was all like, he's just clearly fucked up in it from drinking and doing loads of drugs. And I used to judge him. I used to look down at him like, ugh, who would do that? Be, 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 that's so bad. Be, be, be professional. Me, me, me. On my, from my high horse, right? Well, I wouldn't, wouldn't be a high horse because if I sat on a horse, I might break its back. You know what I mean? That'd be, that'd be a bit sad. Do you know what I mean? I, feel, I would feel bad for a horse. If a horse had to endure my weight, if a horse had to carry me, I feel bad for the horse. You know what I mean? It's like that one lyric in there from fucking Juvenile. If you see the grizzly bear, you know, help the bear. It's like if you see if you see me on the horse, help the horse. You know what I mean? Grab it by its legs or something, support it up or something, because it's a lot of weight to carry. Anyway, um, I was on my high horse judging unique, and then I realized no, YouTube and social media in general should be the platform for black. It should be the priority in content creation on 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 social media should be black Twitter or black people, gays, and mentally ill people. That should be the hierarchy. They're the ones who create the best content. They're the ones that stir the conversation. They're the ones that just like, you know, they're the ones that give you stuff to like talk about and laugh about. So those are the ones that we should be highlighting. So if you see anybody online who's a degenerate, who's a bit mentally ill, who's already fucked up, tune in. It's going to be a fun show. What would you rather listen to? Somebody getting fucking smashed off their face, drinking, doing loads of drugs, or listening to me? ramble about oh it's jordan fours these jordans are coming out oh jordan's in blue they should have made them in yellow uh, the burger is the best club in the world uh, what would you rather that or listen to somebody talk about cultural topics while getting smashed on camera ranting and raving about brian callen and i don't know op and anthony and joe rogan while doing drugs and, and xanax and leaning of course you listen to that it's come on man Damn, I'm so I'm so late to the game as always. I didn't realize it. I was up here trying to be like flipping streetwear NPR, whereas the real the real path to success is me just getting on stream, racking up a couple lines in front of me, opening my beer or my little tonic wine and going woo. That's a real mark to success. You get me? But anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. That's the side again. You know, you know me. It's mental health. It's not, it's not my fortune. It's not my it's not it's not my forte. It's not my strength. You know, I go down different flipping lanes. I do little you know, you know how it is. Anyway, on topic. Vincent Company Burnley boss has a verbal agreement to join Bayern Munich, but a deal's not done yet, according to Sky in Germany. As you've heard that, yes, Vincent Company, the boss of Burnley, who got Burnley relegated this past season, is now in contention to be the Bayern Munich manager. That's not a typo. That's not me. That's not me misspeaking. You heard exactly what I said. Vincent Company is in line to become Bayern Munich manager. If you were to believe the reports online, which are probably going to be true because they're coming from a lot of verified sources, Dimazio, a few other big um, accounts in Germany who, are, who have very good ties and information to the infrastructure of Bayern Munich are saying they're considering giving Vincent Company the job. Why am I highlighting this? Because I've always thought there's a, a bet there's like a contingency there's like a contingency of like football fans online especially man united fans who are obsessed with just winning obsessed with winning and i don't understand this whole winning by any means thing because of where we are as a club where we are now as a club is that we need to rebuild ourselves to get to the point where we're in contention of actually competing to win big trophies again Start from the FA Cup, start from the League Cup consistently, start from Champ Europa League, Champions League, then Premier League. But we need to get back to that level where we were in the past, in the in the nineties, early two thousands. But since Alex Ferguson left, and since um, the City Group took over, we've been completely fucked and kind of been left to the lurches. And of course, since the Glazers have took control, they've kind of like run the club into the mud. But I've always thought that this idea of us playing terrible football but still winning 
was not sustainable because United was always built on fast attacking, entertaining football anyway. We just happened to also win. Cool, no problem. But I think nowadays, nowadays, I think what's happened is that because there's so many, because there's such imbalance in leagues, like the big clubs have all the resources, have all the money, have all the star power. So effectively they can sign all the best players if they want to and kind of make most leagues a one horse race, two horse race, wherever it may be. The teams that are underneath it have only a few other things to compete with, compete for league cups and stuff and nowadays for big clubs anyway even the big elite clubs in the top leagues league cups now are not just mickey mouse cups anymore they're usually the first cup that you get and if you're a new manager it's your first it's your first um, opportunity at trophy to, to win a trophy that season. So a lot of big clubs now are taking League Cup seriously. In the past, the League Cup used to be the one where City will put out their youth team. Now they'll put out their second team of senior players, senior international. So the League Cup isn't as easy as it is anymore. So there's not a lot of cups for the other teams to compete for. So if that's the case, the only other thing you've got to compete for is a high league finish and to also play ex entertaining football, to put on a show for your fans, to provide entertainment. And I feel like United, Manchester United, my beloved Red Devils, we're in a position where I think, my personal opinion has always been, we need to get a manager or get a football structure in place that allows us to start playing good football again. Forget the results shit. I don't care if we win the Europa League. I don't care if we win the fucking FA Cup against City this weekend and shit. That doesn't matter to me, my personal opinion. I personally think it's more important for us to build a stable foundation of good attacking football and then put the players in place that can play that type of football, put the coaches in place that can kind of coach that type of football and slowly evolve down the chain. Because what will happen then, if, for instance, whoever the coaches that comes after Ericsson Hug is shit, when we fire that coach, we won't need to then get 13 new players. That new coach that we get will have to play a similar brand of football that we want, but obviously get results and obviously do good performances. And then you can kind of continue on. Whereas at the moment, the model that we have is almost a model of like, you buy players all with different sort of like styles of play, all with different profiles. Then you sign managers with different philosophies. Then if they fail, you sack them and replace them with another manager. And then they want their own players and just, and then you left it. And you just end up with a surplus of players who are hard to get off the books because you paid them a lot of money, blah, 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 blah. But in actuality, this appointment, this perspective appointment of Vincent Company at Bayern Munich for me represents the shift now that we're seeing in football overall. And the shift is now, it's been cemented. Bayern Munich have confirmed it. Bayern Munich have confirmed it. They've told us now, under no uncertain terms, that style of play is actually more important than league position. Because style of play informs you of where the coach or the manager wants to be, what type of football they want to play, what type of philosophy they want to kind of push out there. Like, that's very fucking important. And obviously, Bayern Munich are proving that to be the case. I love this tweet, courtesy of Bayern and Germany account, that says, Vincent Company said yes to Bayern after five minutes of their first call on Monday. And a lot of people are running with a meme that this is equivalent to you, like, talking to your first baddie, or the first baddie being into you, and you trying to remain cool to have some level of composure because imagine how difficult it must be not to just say yes to any terms and be so excited because you're literally the manager of Burnley they got relegated and somehow you're on the radar of Bayern Munich you're like you're scratching your head like what the fuck is going on this is a fever dream so it's pretty hard not to be excited and not to just say I don't care what the contract is I don't care what you want to pay me I'm coming and when I mean coming I mean both ways as in I'm physically coming, and I mean as I'm ejaculating. In case you guys aren't sure what I'm trying to say. That's what he basically should have said. I am coming in all ways possible. I'm coming from every orifice, from every fucking gap, from every hole, from every flipping joint. I'm flipping coming. That's what you should be saying, but you can't. You have to remain cool. Let your fucking um, representative do the work for you. Get you a good terms. Get you a good deal. Blah, blah, blah. There is a little caveat, though, in this, in that allegedly the reason why Vincent Company is being... Um, scouted or has been headhunters because Bayern Munich are basically soft. Bayern Munich, in a roundabout way, only really want a manager for a year. The reason being because the 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 assumption is that they really want Xabi Alonso, but Xabi Alonso has committed to staying at Bayer Leverkusen for one more season. Right? Um, he probably think he has unfinished business there, especially when they lost the final to Atlanta just the other day, Europa League three 0 He probably want to do a better job in the Champions League going forward, and maybe Europa League if they do get um kicked out, um, knocked out of Champions League. But there's a suggestion that Bayern Munich only want a manager to come in for a year, 
and then wait to appoint the actual manager that they want later on. When you, you know, Bayern Munich are, are, they're a big club. They like to hire and fire quickly anyway. And the other suggestion is that maybe they're also waiting another year, either for Julian Nagelsmann, who they then, end up, who they fired before way too hastily anyway. He's now German manager, um, but he's obviously leading Germany um, to the Euros. So most likely, if he does want to come back to club management, it will be after the Euros. So that's the, that's the only caveat. So it maybe isn't like, oh, Vincent Company is their first choice, but Vincent Company might be the only manager because of his profile because of lack of experience who be ready and who be ready and willing to take a job for a year but the good thing is about football results matter bro if he goes to buy munich for that one year and they play the kind of football that he was playing at burnley but they have better players they he might do some bits and if they play good football if they put on a bit of a show if they're competing if they're free scoring all this malarkey they probably won't even try and hire nagelsman and those guys down the line so he actually has the years to impress. This is actually a pretty good gig, I think, in a way. It's obviously a little bit, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't show that they have total faith in you, but you can make them have faith in you by showing out. And that's the best thing about sports. Unlike any other kind of field, sports is very black and white. The numbers don't fucking lie. So if you go to Bayern Munich and you're fucking getting amazing results, you're on an unbeaten fucking run, you're scoring goals, you're playing great football, highlight reels, like all this malarkey, you're fucking promoting youngsters, you got this 17-year-old coming on who's bossing the pitch and shit, you're going to get the job. So I'm really happy for Vincent Company. Honestly, this is amazing. And this also shows for me what it is to be a club with foresight. When you've got a club with good infrastructure that knows what they're doing, it's about sport and success, not about fucking, you know, um, what do you call it? Commercial success. You're not trying to go for the easy options, which is an Ancelotti, which is a Mourinho and shit. No, 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 no. You're forward thinking. You're like, hold on, let's give this coach a chance who he's seen play good football, but not with the best resources. Let's put him in the best, re let's put him in the best structure with good people around him, with the best players available, with unlimited resources or with the most resources in Germany to buy the players we want and see what he does. That shows vision. That shows foresight and something that Man United are obviously fucking lacking. But the funny thing is, I was checking online how impressive this perspective appointment is. The league table, the, fin the, 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 the final league table for this season, obviously Burnley got relegated, right? They were one of the three teams that got relegated. They finished 19th. If you check here, right, on the league table, the goals against, so that's the goals that Burnley had conceded in the league this season, was 78. They conceded 78 goals right, this season, so a hell of a lot of goals they conceded, if you go to Bayern Munich, <laughs> right, they finished third in the Bundesliga, right, <laughs> and they scored more goals than, than fucking Burnley conceded, they, they scored 94, Burnley conceded 78, so this just goes to show you that style of play is fucking important, because this guy has no right to be in any conversation of any top job ever, right really and truly but because of style of play because of the way he gets his team to play because of the just the attacking nature of it entertaining nature of it where they keep the ball recycle the ball the use of the wingers the unorthodox strikers at the front like really fucking if you watch them actually play Burnley play some good stuff they just weren't good enough to survive in the league because they don't have good players and obviously the defense is a bit leaky but he goes for the fucking jugular he's not someone that's gonna park the bus and shit his team's fucking attack they come to play they come to entertain so obviously if you're Bayern Munich you're like you know what this season's a one-off Leverkusen you're thinking Leverkusen won't do that again next season anyway they're not going to go on an unbeaten run um, they're not going to finish on fucking 90 points and you on 72 it's never going to happen again so you're like you know what it's never going to happen so we're going to probably win it anyway so let's win it in style so big big um, congrats to fucking Vincent Company. hope it works out for him and hope he does get confirmed for the job very 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 soon moving on from that one we got this news courtesy of MUFCB regarding Ericsson Haag setting to leave United sometime at the end of the summer or sometime in the summer, I'm assuming. For me personally, not sure about you guys, but I'm in two minds when it comes to Ericsson Haag. One side of me thinks he does use the injuries thing as an excuse. He goes to it way too often because for me, the main issue isn't the injuries. The main issue is, even when he has his full strength team, I don't see us playing a good brand of football that would justify keeping him. 
He makes too many mistakes in selections. He makes too many mistakes in tactics. He makes too many mistakes in substitutions. He trusts the wrong players. Even the Ahmad Diallo thing is a good example. For fucking the whole season, United fans, myself included, dummies who don't know anything about football. Some of us have never even fucking played the game. We've been saying Ahmad Diallo is the truth. He should be given a chance to play. How's he being kept out of the team by fucking Anthony? He should be. He should get a chance to play. How's he being keep get kept getting kept out of the team by Garnacho, who's clearly getting played too much anyway for his age or whatever it may be? He should be rotated in and out of the squad. How's he not playing instead of maybe even Bruno Fernandez in that kind of number ten position? Why is he not contending for the places? And then because of substitutes, because of injuries. Basically, Basically, um, Ericsson Haag was forced to pick Amadiello. He picks Amadiello, and look at how great he's been played these last few games that he started and come on for United. He's been fucking phenomenal, but we've all known it. United fans have all known that this kid is actually good if you give him an opportunity to play, but he doesn't get opportunities to play. So, all those things included make me think that Ericsson Haag isn't the guy for us. But I'm also sympathetic to the idea that he hasn't had um, the ability to pick a consistent back four. He does kind of, I think, overemphasize the need to have a back four to play good football. I don't agree with that. I think there should be a drop off in the quality of football that you play if you don't have to play your second string. But I should still see the same things. I still should see the same patterns. I still should see the same attacking intent. I still should see the same structure, the same teamwork. At the moment, we're just all over the place, especially when the first teamers go. It's almost like the other guys have no idea what they're doing. It's like, don't you all train as a squad? Why isn't, why isn't the whole first team and the fucking guys on the bench and the youngsters all playing the same way anyway? That's how top clubs do it. All top clubs do that. Barcelona do that. Man City do that. Like, Real Madrid do that. All their fucking teams, from the seniors all the way down to the kids, they all play the same way. So that if your kids come through, you, 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 there's not much work needs to be done to kind of get them to play your quote-unquote style of play. That doesn't really happen at May 9. And then the other thing that I don't like about him too is the falling out of players. I personally think that's not the best way to, especially considering how he picks and chooses his battles. Some people get the stick, some people get the carrot, some people get a hard stick, some people get a soft carrot. That for me, I don't like. And of course, the, my biggest pet peeve with Ericsson Hart, because he reminds me a lot of my Sunday League manager I had at ProStar. If you know anything about London, if you know anything about Sunday League football, you know what I want about ProStar. ProStar back in the day was almost like a, a pro semi it was almost like a pro Sunday league club. The way we used to care about it so much, like you go to trials, you wouldn't get in, you'd be crying on the way home from the bus. Like it's absolutely pathetic how much we cared back then about Sunday league. But big up Pro Star, big up all those guys that are still around. But back in the day, when I used to play for Pro Star, there was a particular manager that I had a falling out with, like a big beef, which led to me fucking breaking the trophy when we went to a cup final and I wasn't and I didn't play. I, I was sub and I came on late in the game and I, this shit player played in front of me and I was fucking furious and I got the trophy and I smashed it on the floor, had a big kind of falling out of the manager and nearly fought him in the change room. Fucking hilarious, right? My little brother still laughing about, <laughs> about it now, but it still makes me angry. But back then, the really issue that I had back then, and I think I've always maybe carried it in my adult age, so maybe I've been scarred, but I always hated unfairness in sport and favoritism because i think sport it should be the one place where all of that stuff get, goes out the window it's impossible not for it to go out the window but i think it should always be about can you do the job are you good enough are you better than the next man are you better than the next woman that's how it should be black and white whereas when i was playing the sunday league club the manager favored the guy that he was picking in front of me like he liked him more as a person for whatever reason we don't need to get into that so i didn't play but then what I didn't like was that if he didn't play well, I also didn't play. So it's like, are you punishing me now because you don't like me? Because it's one thing if you don't like the person, you don't want to give them the, the position to play first. Fair enough. You take that on the chin. But if that guy is having a stinker and I'm the next one that plays his position, play me. But he wouldn't play me. He would just play that guy all the way through. But then in the final, he switched it up and he brought me on, surprisingly. And I came on angry. I wasn't even playing well. I was just, I was just kicking the ball anywhere, not fucking giving a fuck. And when we got a trophy, I smashed it on the floor. Yeah, cool. But that, that was only because of favoritism. And I know from my little level, from my low, low level, playing in Hackney Marshes, right? Sharing a fucking changing room with many fucking dudes and not washing and smelling like shit and carrying a fucking plastic JD bag to the fucking game and shit. I know from my little low level of playing football that if you have favoritism in the club, in the squad, 
it does breed contempt because other players saw that too and they didn't like it. They pulled the guy to one side, but he wouldn't want to listen. Other players in the team were also kind of, you know, uh, fighting a good fight and kind of supporting me and saying, oh, it's not fair that you don't play Zenga. Why, do, why don't you play him? Why can't he get a position? Why can't he play if that guy's not playing? Well, blah, blah, blah. So I have no doubt in Man United, because Ayrton Hag seems to favour certain players like Bruno Fernandes and doesn't drop him, even when he's playing badly, Look at Marcus Rashford. There was a period where Marcus Rashford was playing super shit. So shit that the fans had to turn on him. I think in a way, even though Marcus Rashford was the one to blame because of his performances, I think in a way, Ayrton Hag is also to blame for the recent hate train on, on Marcus Rashford because he kept playing him. He kept playing Marcus Rashford even though he was playing shit. Even though he clearly looked disinterested. Even though he maybe was carrying an injury. Whatever it may be, he kept putting him in a firing line. Then the fans kept fucking giving them abuse, giving them abuse, which then I think bowled over the other day. He was um, on the sub. No, I think he was warming up and some of the fans in the stands were having some words to like, like, say to him. And the thing is, all because Ayrton Hark has too many favourites, he doesn't trust his second squad, which is okay. If you think Bruno Fernandes is the best player in that position and you don't trust the next person on the bench to do the job for you, then guess what? Get another player to do that job. But you can't be playing people every single game, never subbing them, never rotating them, and then being surprised at the end of the season when Bruno Fernandes injures his arm, can't play, pulls up with an injury. You've overplayed these fucking players. So all those things for me are the reasons why I would prefer to just leave Ayrton Hag and tell him bye-bye. Even though he's had extenuating circumstances, he's come under the Glazer ownership midway through, he's then had to change, he didn't have to work with new owners, they haven't really been very encouraging about giving him the assurances in public about whether he keeps his job, they never really helped him publicly when it comes to kicking out players, except for Mason Greenwood, he didn't really get the budget to buy the players that he actually wanted, all of them, blah, blah. there's lots of things, injuries, that he could obviously say as an excuse, but all in all, when it comes to the training ground and the way that we play on the weekends, I just don't see what they do every week. So for me, I'd want him gone anyway. I just don't see it. I don't see it. They spend all week fucking training. We're not in most of the big competitions and we play horrible fucking football. So for that, sayonara, it didn't work. Most likely, whatever clubs he goes to next, he'll probably be a success anyway because he's still a good manager. I think you just need to put him in a good structure and you'll probably be able to get it done. United just too much of a freak show. There's just too much craziness for it to work for a manager who needs help. It's not going to work and uh, at United. He probably took too much on. He probably thought he could do too much and now he's kind of being punished for it and I would prefer if we kind of just split and went our separate ways. But again, what do I know? What do I bloody know? Absolutely nothing. Moving on from that. Moving on from that. Let's talk about this. So, I I'm I put up a question somewhere where I was asking a question regarding this very interesting topic for me. For me, interesting. I know for you guys, you probably won't give a fuck. But for me, it's a very pertinent, pertinent or whatever that fucking word is. Um, topic and something that I wanted to echo and kind of explain here for you lovely jubbly people this is the one right this is the one so I went online and I was browsing doing my thing as I do checking the fucking socials and I stumbled on the lovely Narcissus um, post on their Instagram stories and the post that Narcissus posted was you know Narcissus on their way to a DJ gig having fun got the nice grills on got the nice filter on feeling good little scarf around the neck you know feeling yourself you know pre-geek fucking vibes I haven't felt that in a long time because I haven't been booked in a long time which is fucking making my head spin but I'm gonna have to fucking book a club somewhere and just get myself to play and just like make it look like it's a night with those DJs but it's actually me haha <laughs> trick but yeah, I know how that felt, right? I, I remember that feeling. So the pre-gig feeling, you're feeling yourself, you're feeling a buzz, you're in the backseat of an Uber, you're listening maybe to some tunes to get you in a mood. Me personally, pre-gigs, I don't like to play any real music. I like just to kind of chill and be quiet and kind of relax. And I've also got a rule. If I'm in an Uber, I never ask the fucking Uber driver, hey, do you have a fucking Bluetooth thing? Never. I think that's really rude. I also think it's kind of annoying to be in a car with somebody and then have them fucking play their shitty music while you're trying to drive them somewhere. It's fucking shit. I'd rather put on my own headphones and listen to my own things. If they want to speak to me, I could take it off quickly, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not going to fucking impose myself on this guy's fucking car. I'm doing enough, or I'm doing a lot already by imposing my sweaty fucking ball sacks on their fucking chair. The last thing I need to do is fucking can abuse them and ear rape them with my fucking music so i'm not going to do that cool whatever um Niles is having a good time sitting in the fucking back of the uber ready to go to the gig boom ba 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 boom ba ba and they put this caption at the bottom of their picture that made me wonder what the fuck is going on has something changed in dj world 
So the person put the following. It unfortunately bears repeating. My guest list for Amina Berlin today is full. Right? So the reason why I think this is really interesting is because clearly for me, this is a little bit of a signal. This kind of is, I think, even maybe it's, Maybe it's something that Narcissus didn't mean, but I think this encourages bad behavior. But I also think this is what they want. I think there's been a shift. So the shift has happened lately is I think that there's some DJs out there that don't mind if strangers DM them asking them for guest lists. I know of this culture more because of Bergheim. Because I'm obsessed with Bergheim and I love that club and I've been there so often and I fucking talk about it too much and I'm always fucking cooming about it in my dreams and I can't wait to play there one day. Because I'm always talking about that place, I know of DJs always complaining on their Instagram stories or seeing on Reddits and forums and stuff or people talking about, oh, I reached out to so-and-so DJ to get me on the guest list because the new lineup for Bergheim every month, if I'm not mistaken, the new Bergheim lineup always pops up on their website on like in between the dates of like the 4th and the 10th of the month. So on the 4th and the 10th of June, you'll see the lineup for July and so forth and so forth and so forth. So a lot of people use that as a chance to kind of like jump on and ask a DJ on there to say, hey, can I get a guest list spot? Because obviously Bergheim is known as a hard place to get into. So if you can get a guest list spot to go in there, it increases your chances of getting in. Obviously it doesn't guarantee it because guest list is still... It's just a shorter queue. It doesn't really guarantee you entry, but it's still a good way to get in. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, guess it also permits you to go in for free, if I'm not mistaken. Personally, for me, if I ever did get a guest list, those type of places, I would still give them money. I think people that get guest lists, it, I, I think in general, people that go out on the cheap are bizarre to me. It's like people that vacation on the cheap. People that only want to go on a cheap vacation. Oh, I've only got like a $100 to spend. Bro, stay your house at home. Stay your house at home. I don't know, drive somewhere, get a bus somewhere, sit down, watch YouTube. You shouldn't be going on holiday with 100 fucking euros to spend. That's fucking insane, in my personal opinion. Same thing that happens with people that go to clubs. Oh, I only have 20 pounds. So then you, so you want to get a guest list to get free. Then you want to pre-drink fucking little beer in a park before you get in there. And then you want to get a free ticket so that you don't have to pay any money. Like, come on, relax. And then you want to fucking ask, you know, fucking, you want to beg for fucking drugs from people. And me, the fucking mark that I am, right? I may look like a hard nut. I may look like a fucking gangster. I may look like a fucking thug. I may look like a bad boy. But deep down, I'm a fucking big teddy bear. And I'm always looking for fucking approval and seeking fucking friendship in the fucking nightclub. So if you come up to me asking me for a bump or a pill, guess what? I'm going to give you all of them. So those type of people I fucking hate, right? They take advantage of everybody around them. And, and they never give anything back. So if I ever was to get a guest list in a place like that, I would obviously give the fucking bar people or the ticket guys a tip. Just the ticket money, innit? I got in, here's ticket money. Fuck it, thank you. Here's 20 euros. But some people don't do that. But I've noticed a trend, because um, Narcissus isn't the only person. I saw um, FKA2M4A, I think his name is. I forgot how he said his name properly. But I think he put up a post recently that he had to delete. I think the Bergheim people reached out. But he put up a post like, hey guys, I'm playing a Bergheim, can't wait. Um, send me your DM request. Or I think, the, I think the, the caption even was something like, oh, I'm playing Bergheim. Um, let me know how badly you want to get in and I'll choose the best one. So basically you had to fucking send in a fucking letter of like, you know, some X Factor, American Idol sub story about, ah, oh, when I was 10, I heard Jeff Mills on the radio. Like you have to send some fucking soliloquy to get him to give you a list. I think that's lame, obviously. But it clearly shows a difference in culture. Nowadays, it seems like DJs don't mind people asking them for guest lists. When I was coming up, that was a no-no. Number one, I would never do it. Number one, it's weird to do it when it's like friends, like people that I actually, I consider like scene friends, people that I know, people that do like local parties. That's even a bit weird. But sometimes I just do that because I want to get into a green room and, you know, rack up in fucking peace. It's not really about the fucking getting free. I still pay for my ticket. I just want to get the fucking guesses just so I can go in the back and whatever it may be. And if it's too full, I can go in and chill out and cool and whatever it may be. Um, but a lot of people are hunting for guest lists to kind of go to as many parties as possible for free. And I think that kind of goes against the whole ethos of like dance music and techno music and underground music. You kind of want to support the promoters. You kind of want to support the promoters who kind of putting on fun, interesting shows, who are booking the most obscure artists or supporting up and coming people. So the best way to support them is to buy loads of drinks and obviously pay for your fucking ticket. Like getting guests all the time isn't really a way to encourage good or isn't a way to sort of like you know motivate and give the promoters a chance to kind of do more parties and shit whatever that happens but i've definitely seen a change nowadays on the scene 
with a lot of DJs posting these sort of things, almost as if they're encouraging and they're goading people into asking them because you don't need to put this up online because it's almost as like you're trying to bait people for next time. Oh, next time get in early for Amina. Do you know what I mean? It's like you need to just not do this at all personally. Um, but I also don't agree with people sending DJs guest list requests anyway. I think it's really lame. I personally think it's the lamest thing in the world. I think it goes against everything that goes into kind of going out. It puts way too much onus and emphasis on the guest list and being like behind the stage and standing behind the DJ and feeling like you're other and you're better than people. No, no, no. The whole thing about partying and being a raver, in my personal opinion, is being on the dance floor, not in the DJ booth, not in the green room, like none of that shit. Actually on the dance floor in the heart of the fucking rave, sweating your fucking balls off, trying to get a bump in between two fucking big Slovakians like fucking shooking you from side to side that's the actual and you know the antithesis of raving for me personally I think the other thing is a is an add-on which is fun like it's always fun to kind of pop into a green room and have a bit of a call out but I've been in all of the big club green rooms in the back and you're not missing out on anything you just get some there's just some adults in there in a quiet space doing drugs talking nonsense and you know basically pontificating about how fucking dance music can save the world it's kind of lame to be honest but it's a good place to kind of chill out and obviously put your jacket and coat in somewhere safe where if you're worried about it getting nicked of course but for the most part the main fun and the only place I've had the best times have always been in the fucking dance on the fucking dance floor and guess where second place i also have a lot of fun yes bitch you guessed it in a smoking area even though i don't fucking smoke and sometimes like a fucking loser i might go and buy some menthol cigarettes to feel fucking cool but for the most part the smoking and the dance floor are the best places to connect to meet new people to share fucking new friends or not to share fucking tunes to maybe even meet new friends add people on instagram maybe you'll meet your fucking future partner your future promoter uh, partner maybe your future fucking um what you call it record label executive whatever maybe all those things happen in that little little space there but they happen when you're out in mingling with regular civilians with regular everyday people not in the back like like you're one of those industry heads like who gives a fuck about that shit it's a nonsense so i think all this guest list stuff is really lame people need to fucking relax and chill out and i think the djs also need to chill out within kind of slightly encouraging it like this post did i think it's slightly kind of like oh guys like you guys need to stop with the request like it's like you know like you're just too many people are just like falling over themselves to kind of get into your dms which is probably true to be fair because Narciss is a huge DJ, had a big tune with obviously DJ Heartstrings that's been tearing up the place and just been doing bits anyway in general with the, with, with the sets and stuff. But I just don't really like this approach of like encouraging, semi-encouraging it without really encouraging it. So there were some people online that had obviously different opinions to me on this actual subject. So I'm going to actually read some of these opinions. I won't show them on screen. I don't want to fucking bait anybody up and shit. So I'm just going to read what people have said. Um, some of the responses. One response says this. My good mate told me that the minute they're there announced to play at the Bergheim twice a year, they receive thousands, yes, thousands of DMs from random people with so many stories in order to obtain a guest list. My mother died, my hamster died, it's my birthday, it's my 10 years of anniversary, I would like to take my sister who has cancer. Oh my God. And of course, many not safe for work reasons. Yo, yo, imagine how shameless you have to be to DM a DJ in the first place. Lame, lame, lame. I've done it, lame, it's lame, <laughs> right? Leo, to do it is lame. Then to fucking beg and write like a American Idol, X Factor, you know, mass singer fucking sob story thing that they do in all those fucking things. Like, oh, when I was growing up, it was really hard to be a woman. It was really hard to be black. It was really hard to be disabled. I can't even see. Like all these fucking dumb sub stories, right? And then you're doing that to get guest list spots. Are you dumb? Like, can you imagine? It's actually more commendable to do those sort of sub stories if you were going to get on X Factor on American Idol because legitimately that could change your life. Like, you do a good sub story on there. You talk about how when I was seven years old, my mom used to play John Contrain in the kitchen when she was making American pies. And then when she had a heart attack, John Contrain was playing in the background. And that's why I play jazz because I want to honor the legacy of John Contrain and Robert Johnson and also honor the legacy of my mom. Like, like, that's actually, even though it's fucking lame and pathetic, that actually might get you a record deal. And that might actually change your life and change the life of your fucking family for generations to come. So I get that. But to do it for a guest list at a fucking nightclub, 
where people are getting fisted in the fu- at the at the bar, like I saw the first time I went to fucking Bergheim. I was standing at the fucking bar, you know, in on the main room, w- waiting for my fucking what you call it for my um for my cocktail, and there was a guy next to me, just like just like you know, he's doing that with his back, and I turned around, looked at him, and he was moaning. Looked down, and there was a guy literally like fisting him and shit. I was like, oh shit, welcome to Bergheim, but it's just a club. You can see that everywhere. You can see that in Bethnal Green. You can see that in Peckham. New Cross, Hackney. You can see it anywhere. Come on, man. Anyway, let's continue. All I can say, knowing my friend for the past eight years, they have had pretty much the same close friends, um, give or take, and significant other permanently on their guest list. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know that. So people that play at Bergheim, this person's saying, especially regular, because I get twice a year is basically a resident. It's not really, because I think resident counts as like, uh once it's like bi-monthly right but that's basically a resident to me so this person that plays twice a year in Bergheim basically has the same 10 people on their list and i think the number is 10 that's why i, I think i've heard the same thing too i think the number is 10 that you can have on your guest list so i've read it from somewhere else. Or, maybe, or maybe somebody told me i think actually what's her fucking name um i actually i, I have to need to big up her i think she's the one that gave me some of the background information about Bergheim uh dj guest list stuff what's her name again? i think is it lily is that her name again? I keep. I'm sorry. To, I'm really bad with names, so don't take this insultly because she's a fucking lovely girl. Is it? Is it um, Lily? Yes, it. Lily Ackerman. So big up my girl Lily Ackerman. We just DM back back in the day about some stuff back in the burger and shit. So big up Lily Ackerman. She's the one that fucking told me about the whole like how much the list, the longest list is, how far ahead. You know, like cause basically, I think she told me, if I'm not mistaken, that I think you get to know when you're playing a month earlier anyway. That's the thing that people don't realize. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the DJs find out they're playing at Bergheim a month before. So we see the guests, we see the lineup a month before it happens, but they find out a month before. So by the time you DM them, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. So it must be fun anyway for DJs to get stories anyway. But the, the other one that's really funny is a not, for, not safe for work reasons. Can you imagine the amount of horrors? As fucking black youngster would say. Can you imagine the amount of whores that DM fucking DJs offering them sexual fucking activities in exchange for a guest list spot? What's more pathetic, actually? Being a man and begging another man for a guest list spot, which is already very cringe, right? Or being a woman and offering to fucking suck some 47-year-old guy's dick, some middle-aged man, dick because you know you want to guess the spot what's actually worse having to type out the words i will do anything for that and then put the fucking emoji of the wink or the demon time thing smiling or being a, a dude and be like hey man what's up hope you're well like what's actually worse i don't know i don't know which one is worse bro i think they're both degrading because if you're the girl and you offer to suck someone's dick for a guest list just follow through if you follow through even though it's kind of whorish, you know, whatever. We've all done shitty things. For sh- We've all done some stuff we're not proud of. Whatever. But I think there's something as a guy, your dignity on pride and your ego, type in a word, be like, hey, mate, oh, big fan, <laughs> big fan. You know what I mean? There's something about being a man and doing that that will never sit well with you. I think a woman... It's kind of understandable, especially if you're hot as well, right? Or you're to the or you're to the flavor of whoever the person is. Maybe that kind of works out. But if you're a dude and you're just DMing guys, like, bruh, take a look at yourself in the mirror. Like, literally, look at yourself in the mirror. You should be ashamed. Um, anyway, it continues. It says, I feel generally, unless you know them personally, it's pointless DMing a Burkine DJ because you're literally one of thousands. And you know what's funny too? I bet you. These people that DM Bergheim DJs are the ones that are clout chasery and dumb because I bet you they don't even DM the ones where the lineup isn't good. They only DM the ones where it's a stacked lineup. Like there's a, I don't know, there's a, what you call it? There's a Sylvester, there's a Gay Pride one, the CSD one, um, whatever special events. I bet you don't need a DM of that one or the big ones at the end of the month. Oh, DV- DVS one is closing. Renee Wise is opening. Orgasm is playing. Blah, blah, blah. Those are the ones that they fucking chase after. The ones that everyone wants to go to, right? Maron is fucking playing. Renee Wise, all these things. Then they're fucking running. It's like, bruh, actually, if you want to do the whole fucking sucking off DJs things, maybe the smart idea is to go for the lineups that aren't that stacked 
and maybe choose a DJ that's not that well known. Maybe they don't get that many requests. Probably they do. But if you're gonna do it, at least use some tactics and you know think of something. But when you're a fucking clout chaser, there is no tactics. The only tactic is anyway. We continue. Um, they also mentioned since TikTok era, the stories have become more outrageous and laughable. It's also a bit delusional, though, to think a DJ wouldn't have ten close friends or business partners they'd rather take than some fan. There's some random fam in their DMs. That is where I disagree, this poster. I disagree with you there. You're saying people are delusional to think that these DJs don't have friends. I, I would say DJs are probably the most lonely people in the world. I think by nature, the job is very lonely. The job is very socially isolating because of what it requires. It requires you to play what? For the most part, between the, the days of Wednesday to Wednesday, essentially, right? If, if you're a DJ and you actually you you got like more than 100 gigs per year, you're probably playing Wednesday to Wednesday most weeks, which which requires you to be away for most of the time. You're staying in hotels. You're not really visiting the cities and exploring. You're kind of living out of a fucking carry-on suitcase and shit. Where do you have the chance to meet people and to make friends, have a relationship, hold down a family, kids, even pets, I think. It's probably difficult. If you're a DJ, like, how do you have a dog? What, you have to take it with you all the time. You can't just leave the dog by itself in the flat. You're going to leave it with your fucking parents or your fucking colleagues or your, your friends. That's also a bit, you know, presumptuous and puts a burden on them. And also you lose connection with your pet, whatever. It's kind of lonely. So I wouldn't be surprised if there actually is less. DJs have the, DJs are the most lowest people and actually need friends. So why not reach out to random fans who actually love you and appreciate you for who you are? Love you as a fucking DJ. They love your fucking lifestyle. They want to be around you. They give you loads of fucking affection. They loads of give you fucking attention. They give you that good dopamine hit. It actually is a good idea to actually have fans, actually, on your guest list. And if you want to be, if you're like an Ibiza thing, actually think about it, right? If you're an Ibiza DJ, I would prefer, if that was me, and again, I wouldn't do it because I'm not an Ibiza DJ. But if I was an Ibiza DJ and I was in that scene, I'd much rather give my guest list out to random fans and have my fans be in a booth with me, giving me good vibes, good energy, being positive, being fucking hype, than have some fucking, you know, some failed Austrian model there with her fucking, you know, um, chopped up fucking, you know, what you call it, half basketball fucking tits doing some shitty fucking hot girl dance there. I don't want that. Dead vibes. I want actual fans. Right? I don't want fucking clout chasers, scenesters, you know, whatever, socialites. I want actual fans. So I get them in a the booth. The only only caveat to that is that fans could be a little bit too much, right? They could be a little bit familiar, a little bit too, like, handsy, a little bit too affectionate, right? A little bit too comfy. They start fucking, you know, drinking all your rider to the fucking face. Like, bro, relax, man. Put my Ciroc down. Put my Grey Goose down. Put your phone down and chill. You know what I mean? So you have to police them a little bit. But I honestly do think DJs are quite lonely, which is why they put those posts up as a way to kind of get attention, to kind of get feedback, get people to kind of message them. And on the other side of it too, I also think another thing, DJs probably, their friends are probably letdowns because of the flaky, flaky nature of their relationship. So they'll put a friend on the guest list and they won't turn up. So now you're taking up a spot. Because if, if Berghain has 10, let's say every club has like a limit of the guest list, five to 10 people. You put one person on there, you're almost denying everybody else a chance. And especially if you don't turn up, it's kind of like, bro, do you know what I mean? And it's like, when that guest list is done, it's really hard to kind of, because I've done club nights myself. I put people on guest list before. They usually do them ahead of time. And when the time is, it's like a hard line time because it's annoying to add people on there. Unless you know the bouncers, you can particularly maybe ask them and they can put it on there for the other time. But for the most part, once you've handed it in, you've handed it in. So if you don't turn up for a gig, you kind of fuck over not only the DJ, but also fuck over other people that could have taken that spot. So maybe if you're a DJ, actually giving this around to people is the best way to go about things. Who knows? Either way, I found that response to be hilarious. Let's read through a couple more and I'll move on. The guest this spot, Barter Economy, is the most depressing affair anyway. There's a whole egos and identities, relationships built around it. Sad. Especially in London. I feel like in London, the scene is weird, man. It's almost as if like people... This is what we're going to say. I almost feel like people in London, especially the techno scene, are way more obsessed with being like friends with people than they are about enjoying the music. If that makes sense. Everyone wants to appear like they're in the in group. They're in the cool group. They're going to the cool festivals, the cool parties. Like they're all friends. Like I do. I, 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 or maybe that's maybe that's just my 
lack of being able to connect to people and be like more open i kind of go to the rave just do my own thing and kind of have a good time a party have a good time record my, my fucking audio clips i need to record do my review and i kind of go to sleep i'm already looking for like a community you know what i mean yes it's, it's good to be there but i don't really you know whatever I'll, I'll see you at the next rave it's not that big of a deal but i think some people go into it for that or they want to be involved in the industry as well. So there's that kind of thing. Like, okay, I don't want to be a DJ, but I want to be like a booking agent. I want to be a social media manager. All this sort of shit. It's like, eh, not for me. Anyway, continues. Um, Another one says, uh, I reach out to DJs for their G-spot. Ha ha. Good joke there. Another one says, if DJs are asking people online to send them fresh new music. This is a deranged, by the way, take. This is a deranged take. This guy says here, or this person says. If DJs are asking people online to send them fresh new music, then they shouldn't. Then sh then why shouldn't random people ask them for guest list? Hear that again. If DJs are asking people online to send them fresh new music, then why shouldn't random people ask them for guest list? If they don't have it, okay, peace out. It's a guest list, not a kidney. How could you try and gaslight at the end when you're asking me for a favor? Like, what the fuck is that? How are you gonna ask me for a favor? Or be over over friendly, over presumptuous, and then try and gaslight at the end. Okay, oh well, sorry, not my fault, I ask. It's like, yo, no wonder these DJs leave you on scene. Now I understand why these DJs don't even open people's DMs. People are fucking annoying. You ask me for a guess this, and then because I, I I say no, you're like, oh well, chill out. Uh, I'm sorry I asked. It's only a question. It's like fuck your question and fuck your life. It is a to me it's a kidney. To me, a guess this is a kidney. And I give my kidneys to my family and friends. How about that? Okay, cool. People are weird, isn't it? Last one. Last one. Last one. Last one. Last one. Um, another person says here, I've seen DJs offer guest list, but usually in cities where they don't live or don't know that many people. Other clubs can be very free with guest list spots, so why not? But Bergheim is very limited and very coveted. Many DJs have booking agents, managers, promoters, other cities in town who they deal with in real life friends. So most guest list spots are gone before lines are announced. Yeah, true. That I understand. That's actually a good idea. Like a, if, you, if you're a big DJ, but you're going to a smaller market and, you're not, and, and the turnout isn't going to be that great anyway, why not put give, give your fans? Because that's actually a good way to actually have a loyal fan base. I know there's some DJs out there that look... That's the thing. I know there's some DJs out there that look down on their fans. They look down on the listeners. They look down on the ravers. They just want you to, like, dance in front of them and go crazy. But they don't want you to communicate with them or speak to them. Like, go, get fucked. It's a very one-way relationship. Like, give me love. Give me affection. Give me attention. Buy my shit on fucking Bandcamp or whatever. You know, whatever it may be. But don't... We're not friends. Don't talk to me. You know what I mean? Don't be familiar. But I think if you actually want to build connections with people, go into a smaller location... And then giving out free lists to people will build an uncre a crazy like link. I always say, I share this story all the time. But that one brief half a second interaction I had with Harry Styles in fucking Alibi back in the day, I defend that guy to the hill online. Anytime I see someone chatting shit, I'm in a fucking Twitter. No, oh, Harry wouldn't do that. I'm defending him. But just because of that one brief interaction where he said, hey, what's up, man? Nice to meet you. I was like, I'm your fan for life. So if you're a DJ and you go to a small market and you give your spots to like random kids in fucking Bergamo, right? They're going to be your fans for life because you took them to the back room. They got green room passes. They look cool to their friends in their local area. You, they, they, you get picked with them. They get picked. They can put on their socials. It's not that difficult, but you know, DJs and their egos. Um, and that's basically it. So in my opinion, long story short, please do not email DJs for guest lists. Be a fucking normal person uh go pay your ticket attend the raves have a good time and go fucking home honestly the fun and the vibes is always on the dance floor it's not in a green room it's not on the back it's not with these guys the vibes are always on the dance floor that's where you meet your people you meet your tribe you meet your quote unquote community you might even meet the love of your life in the fucking dance floor or on the way to the toilet going to it but you don't meet them in the back room of a fucking green room everyone there's looking for clout everyone there's fucking you know social climbing nonsense whatever you know it's just not the place to be i think so the community is built on the fucking dance floor that's my impression but again i could be wrong i really could be wrong next we got this this we got this uh to play so i'm gonna play this clip that features adam 22 on no jumper explaining why he fired everybody um, if you don't know, I'm going to briefly surmise Adam22 of No Jumper recently decided to cancel all the podcasts across the board with the exception of two. And basically the idea behind it is to focus more on quality and quantity. But obviously because he's done that, a bunch of co-hosts who have kind of 
their whole identity is kind of no jumper. They've done a lot to kind of try to steady the ship after the, those initial people left, the ADs and TROs and stuff. They obviously bummed, they lost their jobs, and it kind of came out the blue, and it was with the media effect with no real kind of warning. So everyone's been talking about it, or everyone on my side of the internet has been talking about it. It's been a big topic. So I'm going to play a little bit of the clip where Adam22 speaks about it on the Tuesday show, I think. Is it Tuesday show? Yeah, I think it's a Tuesday show. Um, and then I'm going to obviously offer some of my co commentary regarding people getting fired in general, because I think there's always a right way and a wrong way to do it and i think partly um adam did it kind of in the wrong way in my personal opinion but i'm going to play the clip for you and then you can kind of make up your own mind you can make up your own blood clot mind the only burning question i have at the top of my head with the split is you said it was non-financial you talked to your business partner so that's the main thing right well, that was one of the. Not that, that was one, wasn't that was one of the base. You said it was non-financial. I mean, sorry, it was, it was a financial. It was, yeah, yeah. Oh. Looking at how much each one of these shows cost to operate, and I think boom, honestly, boom, it was kind of like an aesthetic decision slash like just a content decision as mm -hmm. well slash a sanity of mind decision slash a business decision for me to just kind of realize like take a step back. I hate to do this, but I kind of got to like look at all of my peers in the space and okay. kind of compare myself to them, look at their business models. I look at somebody like, you know, Ack obviously is kind of focused on the streaming thing. I feel like he's faced challenges with trying to put together the academy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I look at somebody like Vlad, I look at the way that he segments his content up. He doesn't have any consistent shows on his podcast that he's not a part of aside from the Reggie Wright one that he's been trying mm -hmm. to spearhead. I'm not sure exactly what's gonna happen with that. I look at Say Cheese, they really probably drop like the least amount of content of right. anybody, but I feel like the quality is very high yeah. and still say mm -hmm. cheese has a great brand name regardless. And he's able to do other things that make money, like utilizing the say cheese branding. I think for me, no jumper. If you look at it through 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. 2019, it was like very focused around one thing. It was like, we're going to get as many interviews as possible. We're going to do the best interviews we can. As you go into 2020, Views. Our natural reaction to the pandemic is sure. kind of like we need to double down on just like whoever we got here talking on camera, right. enter into what was realistically a kind of impressive era when we had at the end of the day it really was, kind of it thriving. Was crazy. No, it was crazy. Yeah. When you think about it, T. Rel, as much of a bozo as he has shown himself to be over the past year, saying. he, him, AD. <clears throat> shout out to ad i guess uh and do know like putting them all together on a show mm -hmm. that was pretty impressive so then we kind of like kept chasing after that building up more shows more hosts etc disconnected and that, yeah exactly and like yeah. having all those kind of go at the same time was kind of like unprecedented within the hip-hop space to have like one channel that had this many different shows doing good and i feel like in the wake of them leaving the channel mm -hmm. i spent a year basically trying to sort of rebuild all that and I think ultimately the conclusion that I kind of drawn was that I don't that need, a... I, I don't need to be holding on to like things that previously worked on the podcast or gotcha. whatever. Like I just need to be a little bit faster to identify what's working and what isn't. And I'm I, I feel like at a certain point in time, my view of content creation was that the only way we we're going to make money is by creating an absolute shitload of content. That's not really necessarily the case at this point. And in fact, I even felt like we were kind of losing money on certain things. So what I really wanted to do this week was just do like a full reset, simplify No Jumper down to like the, the, the simplest bones. parts that actually work. Right. And obviously there's been, a, 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 I actually feel like almost everybody that I spoke to, everybody I spoke to on the phone took it very well and was very cool about it. Rick Baby, Lush, Almighty, uh, Flacco, et cetera. Yeah. I called DW Flame. I understand that he was saying that I did not call him today on the news. That yeah, is not true. Did I, I double did double down on that? What? I doubled down on I that. I didn't watch any of the clips. I'm just uh, like reading Reddit titles I to just, base my, say my that knowledge I knew of, that you right. called. So I was just like, did he call oh, you okay. or not? Because I did call him. You know, I him. wanted to have that conversation mm -hmm. with DW. He's been around here like the shortest period of time. I okay, anyway, you get the gist of what he's been saying. You get the gist of it. Essentially, that end bit kind of surmises why it kind of didn't work and it flopped for him anyway. But. My basically, my conclusion on this whole affair is like, there's always a right way to go about firings and a wrong way. The wrong way is the way that we all know, which is the lack of communication, which I've obviously suffered from. Um, I think I shared this story before on the podcast, but I was working for Depop for like a very, very long time, being like a community support 
agent basically which basically is basically which is essentially just customer service so i was handling a lot of the inbound queries where's my item where's my refund all this malarkey on depop for a re for like a year maybe a year and a half and stuff really really good time working there i was working at depop when they had their original office at zetland house which is near like old street and then i stayed there during the transition of when they moved to the new office which is like near liverpool street kind of area it's a really nice spanky one with great facilities and it's it's like it's done by this really famous architectural firm that designed it it's a fucking cool office i stayed there for a couple of months but then obviously i had the high and mighty idea of moving and going to another company the reason why I left actually Depop was basically because I didn't feel like I had any route to going to kind of, you know, progressing and kind of getting a promotion. I didn't feel like I could jump for another team. Like the other, the, the logical step for me to go from working in customer service was obviously to go work in marketing. That's basically a lot where my experience is. I've done a lot of marketing managing. I've done a lot of social media managing. I've done all that sort of stuff. You know, the usual stuff you can kind of imagine someone like me carrying a MacBook Air underneath my armpit would fucking be into, right? All the fucking stuff that doesn't really matter in a, in a big company. I've kind of done that. And obviously that was a place I wanted to go in. But unfortunately, when I was at Depop, this lady, I forgot her name, but she's like a famous like influencer. I think she's from New York. She joined Depop. And again, it's not her fault, but she seemed like a bit of a bitch. And I didn't necessarily vibe with her that well. Not again, not her fault. She seems like a cool girl, but she brought a little bit of that fashion-y, cool kid, bitchy vibe to Depop. I think so, personally. I don't think it existed before she came, but when she came, she'd like, you know, she got that marketing team into fucking shape. She cracked the whip, but by cracking the whip, she also made it very separate to the whole company. They kind of were walking around a bit high and mighty before we were all kind of together. But then I felt like when she came, it kind of, they kind of made the marketing team a bit more separate and they almost felt like they were like an agency working within Depop. It was fucking weird. So I didn't feel like, I've never been somebody that's been which is kind of my, to my detriment. I've never been someone that's good at working, at knowing how to kind of social climb. Like I can work the room. I think I'm good at working a room, but I'm not good at like sucking up to people if I don't really give a shit about you as a person. It just doesn't work that way. So because of that, I didn't want to put myself through it. So I thought, you know what? Let me do the, the admirable thing. Let me not stay and be angry and be pissed off at my job. Let me go look for another job. And I also thought, oh, I stayed here for a year and a half. This would be a good chance to kind of get new experience, improve my pay, and kind of go from there. Obviously, it flopped <laughs> because the next place I went to, it only stayed around for three months and then the, the company went bankrupt. But thinking back, right, thinking back, there's no way that that guy at that new company that I went to didn't know that the company was already on thin ice. But he still hired me. That's the thing that I think is fucking, like, unforgivable. So that lack of communication, I think, is the worst thing because it's okay. A company fails, like Adam22 said. He tried to compete with Figmunity World. He tried to do, like, content for content, view for view, bar for bar type of battle. He tried to recreate the magic of having AD, AD T-Rail, all these guys on his fucking platform with these new people. It didn't work. That's fine. But if it doesn't work, give man a heads up. Don't just announce it on the day. Don't just call me on the day announce it on your snapchat and then it's done the next day that's what you basically done it's almost in a period of like three days you guys are out it's finished no even like two week notice not even to the end of the month or well, end of the month is basically next week but still give me a bit of like come on man like do me a fucking favor like communicate same with my guy at the other company that i was with if you're gonna hire somebody and i think to be fair anyway that guy was a bit of a crook anyway he's a fucking crook and if i ever did see him on road now I'd fucking smash him over the head with a, with a fucking steel baseball bat, even though I fucking got my money. Word on fucking mother. But that guy's a crook because I think personally he must have hired me and others because, you know, in startup world, it's a kind of a bit of a scam. Like if you hire more people or if you have like a more diverse workforce, you can maybe use that to your advantage in your fucking deck to get more money in the next round of investment. It sounds batshit crazy, but it's kind of true. That's what they did. So I think he hired me under the proviso. Okay, cool. This big black dude, right? It's going to come into his company. He's going to make us look diverse and cool and hip. And we're going to use him in a deck. They actually used me when we went to a fucking Amazon meeting, which is something, you know, whatever, a story for another day. And then we're also going to get some money and it's going to be fine. But he should have gave me the, he should have gave me the choice to make my own grown up decision at that interview. He said, Hey guy, I like you. I want to hire you, but I just want to let you know, this is very confidential, but this company only has like six months of runway. Are you willing to commit and try and gamble? And then I could, I could decide then if I want to, if I could decide to gamble or stick with Depop. 
but he didn't give me that choice. He just said, yeah, we're good to go. Come to the company. You're our social media manager. You can be the brand director. Maybe you can be the creative director. So he gave me, he gassed me up, bro. He fucking, he gassed me up. You know what I mean? He shot me full of fucking hope. And obviously <laughs> that hope came gushing out of my mouth because nothing fucking transpired. So I think in this particular case, Adam 22 fucked up with his lack of communication. The DW Frame story that he's telling here at the end, DW Frame was kind of angry and kind of pissed off on the news, basically saying that, oh, everybody else got a call. I didn't get a phone call. And Adam 22 is arguing, oh, no, I did call you, but that's not good enough for an owner or CEO. If you called him once and he didn't pick up, call him again. Leave a message. Say, hey, DW, I have a very important call. With, I really need to jump on the phone. Let me know when it's a good time. Text me back. Let me know when, I could, when we could talk. You have to get on the phone with them until... But before you get on the phone, don't discuss it on camera. And this is the main thing I don't like about Adam. He's not a good leader. He's not a good boss. He might be a good visionary in terms of like where to take the company, what type of ideas to have and shit. But in terms of the day-to-day -day managing of people, he's horrible because he's a horrible person. Basically, deep down, he doesn't really care about people in, in actuality. He uses people like pawns. And it's obviously showing because he, he kind of disregarded. And, and again, I think those guys kind of were full of themselves a little bit too much as well. ADT and those guys, they kind of think way too much of themselves. But I think they are right in that Adam did, was too quick to dismiss their contribution. Act as if they weren't really that important to No Jumper. They didn't really add to the bottom line. They didn't really change things. They didn't really contribute. But then when they left and he tried to recreate the magic, he fell flat on his feet. He fell flat or they fell flat on their face. And now he's having to change his whole business model up because he couldn't compete. And just believe he's trying to do this whole like sympathy, maturity, or oh, it's, you know, but if Figmunity World had to cancel or had to fire people or had to restructure, he'd be dancing on their graves. He'd be going fucking crazy. He'd be having a, a blast if it was them. So don't have too much sympathy for this guy because he was the one that tried to get low, tried to sling dirt, tried to sling mud and shit. It didn't work out. And now he's all like, Ugh. but all this to say, all this to say, there is actually a good way. There is actually a good way to fucking let go of people. And I have to give a big shout out to my guy, Craig, of this former company I used to work for called Parade World. Parade World was a pretty cool company to work for. It also came at a time where I was fucking struggling, struggling out here sending CVs out for like a year plus, no reply. I think in that year, I might have had like two face-to-face -face interviews. It was tough. That was during like the peak of COVID. I was struggling hard, right? And then this Craig guy takes a chance on me at Parade World and hires me as an ops guy, customer service, blah, 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 type of thing. And it was a great job because I got a chance to like do a lot of stuff like working with the stores, onboarding them, talking to them through how to put their, their items up on the store, you know, helping to kind of list things and, you know, streetwear, skatewear type of company. Fucking amazing. But unfortunately, that company went under because the business model just it's kind of like a similar business model to Farfetch. It's basically like a marketplace for brands. So we don't really have any inventory. The inventory was mostly on the store side. They list their stuff on our site, make it look like it's ours. But then you obviously buy it through them. They get this, you know, whatever. It's kind of whatever. It didn't work. It's convoluted. Cool. But he told us literally four, two to four months ahead of time. Said, hey guys, we've literally got six months of runway. I'm trying my best to get some investment. I'm trying my best to raise some money to give us more. But if it doesn't work out, this is going to be the end because I'm going to scale down the company and it's only going to be me and this other person, Asma as well, big up Asma. We're going to be working and holding the company down until the end of the year and then it's going to be done, unfortunately, and I'm going to have to get a real job. And he literally did it. I think in the end, when it came to it, I think he must have put his house on sale. Like this guy was real, like a real CEO, a real founder, a real business guy. Like he was putting on the line, like we never missed our pay. It never came late. Um, he gave us plenty of heads up at, at the end. Um, he gave us a nice fucking hamper um, as we left, like as a thank you. Like, hey guys, I'm really sorry it didn't work out. He almost felt, he almost felt embarrassed by it. And I was like, nah, don't feel embarrassed, bro. It's a business, isn't it? It didn't work. It is what it is. What can you do? There were some mistakes done along the way, but it's just what it is, isn't it? Like the nature of the business changed. That whole uh, marketplace kind of platform thing doesn't work anymore. So it is what it is. What can you do? But he was so gracious about it, so kind, so thoughtful. And again, the communication about it, the communication. One day, he basically called us all into the office because we were mostly working remotely. We had one or two days we'd go into the office to do like power sessions and shit. But he called us into the office one time, didn't really give us a heads up. But then throughout the day, he took us all into a room and spoke to us individually. I saw me personally, I'm a, I'm a low maintenance. I'm a matter of fact kind of guy. I, I'm a straight shooter. I don't really waste any much. I don't really need a lot of comforting. But other people in the company obviously took it, didn't, took it, didn't take it too well. But he spent hours with people the whole day. He took people in the room, 
spread the news to them, spoke to them for a long time, like literally, and this is obviously not including all the time that he spoke to us before, giving us a heads up, like just like, hey guys, don't plan a wedding or anything, don't do it, because this is whatever, do you know what I mean? He laid it all out for us in the thing, and at the end, he gave everybody the grace to have that one-on-one -on -one human, eye-to-eye, mouth-to-mouth, ear-to-ear, B.O.-to-B.O. fucking conversation in the room. And that was something I was like, wow, bro, what a contrast from going from another company, that other company I was at previously, where I was there for three months and the company went under. And I think at the time, I think I might have been on holiday. I think I might have been on like a staycation in Manchester. I was, in a I was on a staycation in Manchester. I was waiting for my pay to come through so I could like buy some other shit. I went to go check my account. Nothing was in there. And then when I went to, when I went to, when I went to check the Slack, the Slack had been closed down. I was like, oh no. Oh, I got the email notice on my thing, like, your email is this. I was like, what the fuck happened? And luckily I had the, because the, sometimes, I don't, know, I don't know about you at work, but not every workplace I have the, the fucking numbers of my colleagues. Luckily I had the number of one colleague. I was able to text her quickly on WhatsApp, like, hey, what the fuck's going on? And she gave me the, the lowdown. And I was like, oh my God, literally found out like that. Like, I didn't even get any communication. So to go from that style of hiring and firing... So that to the other one with um, Craig at Parade World is a big difference. But I think the main thing, the main thing for me, the main thing for me is communication and giving a shit about your people. This guy doesn't give a shit about anyone but himself. And it goes to show now the, the chucking chickens are coming home to roost because now you don't give a shit about anybody else. Cool. Make all the money for yourself. But now you're on your own. And, and and the other thing as well, he's fucked up a sharp too. The sharp thing I don't like, man. I don't again say what you want about sharp, but he held down fucking no jumper. He was the one defending no jumper. He was there that rid the fucking storm when he was going through all this shit, getting cancelled for diddling and allegedly dating underage girls. Sharp fucking stood there and took all the beatings with him. He took all the fucking lashings. You know what I mean? Because when he was getting cancelled, they were looking at sharp as well and bringing up his sex trafficking thing. Oh, you're a pimp, blah 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 blah. He was getting loads of fucking strays. He was getting loads of fucking friendly fire, not so friendly fire coming his way. And then that now look, now Sharp is what it's kind of got kind of been like pushed out as well. Like honestly, these type of people you should be careful. Like when like it's that saying, and as that saying goes, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. When somebody shows you who they are, fucking believe them. But anybody, everybody at no jumper, keep your heads up. Hopefully everybody lands on their feet. I've seen a few people start their own streaming thing. Um, Suspect is doing his. Also, I hope that suspect doesn't watch the Reddit too much because the Reddit people are, oh, look at his fucking setup. It looks like a potato. But bro, these guys on Reddit were complaining. That's the thing. Never listen to the internet. Just do your content because the guys on Reddit, they run no jumper anyway, right? They, they bully them into doing anything. They were complaining that these guys don't have their own motion. Oh, they don't have their own motion. They don't do their own thing. They're relying on fucking Adam22. Suspect does his own thing. He's starting. Because, you know, it's hard to start this shit. Like, I had to start with help from you guys and shit. Like, it's difficult to start this sort of stuff and know what you're doing. He started, and now people are complaining about the fucking quality. But, like, let him, let him fucking build. Let them build. Let them build. So, let's hopefully that helps. Hopefully that works, sorry. Hopefully they kind of build from there. But when I saw this firing of the host at No Jumper, it brought back so many bad memories of the times that I've been let go. And it was really, really brutal. And it hurts you so much. And you start to question <laughs> every decision that you made in your life. And you start to wonder, like, maybe I deserve this for X and Y thing. Because I also had a run. I also had a run where I was so lucky. I worked for some great startups that I gained a lot of... Because the, the thing about startups is that they're fucking chaotic. They're a bit of a nightmare. Especially if you work in ones... I worked in ones where they had, like, a flat hierarchy. Which is... An, anytime you go to a company and they tell you you've got a flat hierarchy, run. It's a, it's a nonsense. Flat hierarchy basically means there is no boss. That also means it, there's endless meetings. Meetings about meetings about meetings because no one can make a fucking decision, right? So it's fucking awful. So never work in a company where they have a flat hierarchy and free co-founders because trust me, there's going to be beef. So I've worked in those type of places and they're fucking a, they're a nightmare. But the good thing about a startup is that you get a chance to sometimes work in a role that your CV doesn't permit you in other places. They, they, they take more of a chance. They're, they're about doers. So if you can show an acumen or a, percent, or a propensity to do something, if you can show you can actually do the job, they'll just give it to you. So you get a chance to get experience in a role that you probably wouldn't get if you worked in the corporate world, blah, blah, blah. So that's good. But the other flip side of it where it's, why it's fucking shit is all this stuff, the shakiness of it. One day you're, you know, you're fucking having a great time. You're on stream, hanging out at 22. Next time he's doing a Snapchat video telling you your job is fucking gone and now you have to fucking, you know, cancel all your fucking summer holidays. It's fucking brutal. It really is fucking, fucking brutal. 
But hey, what do I know? Absolutely nothing. So let's quickly move on to that one. Um, I quickly want to talk about this. This is an interesting clip. This features um, Rory and Moore on their podcast, episode number 270, where Rory, sorry, when Moore actually specifically speaks about the negative reactions he got from people online regarding his opinions on the Drake and Kendrick beef. And he said he was very surprised when he saw a bunch of people online who he would consider friends having some very mean-spirited things to say about his defense of Drake during the beef with Kendrick. And it almost made, and it kind of made me think about when I lost interest. Because there was a period of time where I was taking part in the debates online, especially on Twitter, and I was kind of contributing and kind of adding to the conversation. Then it got to a point where I was like, this is a bit lame. People are taking this way too seriously. There's like personal attacks flying all over the place. People are being very mean and the thing that they're saying. And I'm just like passionately defending somebody that I like the music of. That's it. That's what that's what hip hop debate should be, always be about. Not about, you know, insulting somebody's intelligence, saying that person's a faggot because they like fucking Drake. Like all these weird things. I was like, bro, what the, where the fuck, where the fuck am I? Like, what is this? So that kind of turned me off on the beef and it kind of got a bit drawn out, a bit tired for me personally. But obviously in more, he's obviously of a much higher profile. And he had this clip that went viral where he was very emotionally defending Drake. And kind of perplexed at how people could view it a certain way. And it sounded like his voice was breaking, like he's about to cry. So everyone was kind of looking at that. And for some reason, obviously the mocking thing makes sense. But they were going extra hard with the insult, saying some very mean-spirited things, especially his friends. And in this particular clip, he says how disappointing it was to check his social media notifications, go through his mentions and see some of the things that his supposed quote-unquote friends had to say because of his opinion on Kendrick and Drake. So let's hear what more has to say about it like a bunch of comments and things like that about me like in the last week okay How, what? it's interesting to see a few faces and a few names in there that's talking crazy me very interesting <laughs> all demaris i didn't see well i didn't see demaris i didn't see nothing with demaris but it's it's been it's been interesting seeing the people that are have some very you know questionable energy and things to say i mm. do as of recent i've done a lot of like reddit cleansing and comment cleansing i don't particularly like check the way i used to yeah but then I'll do what you do. Like weeks later, be like, all right, man, I got some time. Let me see what's yeah. going on. And it, that might piss me off more. Because now if it's somebody I know or someone that I need to text about a comment they had, yeah, so much time has passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're probably like, why are you, yeah. why are you hitting like, me why now? This, bro? Why yeah. now? Because <laughs> yeah. I just saw it. Now I'm mad. Yeah, now, now I'm not really mad, but it is, it, like, it is some people in there that, that I, I had said some things. And it's like, oh, okay. Like I know, I know where to put. I know which compartment to put you in now. Like yeah. we not as we not as cool as we once was. Mm. Yeah, that's a fact. It's a few niggas that set, had some shit to say, and I'm just like, what? But what's crossing the line with like rap debate stuff and associates? Uh, just questioning things that have nothing to do with the music about me personally. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Like when people start doing that, start saying things that's like personal. Because all of this yeah, shit is like, subjective. It's music we're talking about here. None talk of about it is, Kendrick and Drake. What, yeah, do, I, like, what do I have to yeah, do? Yeah, like none of this is none of this is that serious. But it's like some people have had some things to say in some comments where it's like, oh, you it's something else you feel some way about. This is a this is a personal comment that you posted on the internet. And you got my number. Hmm. So yeah, but you can't really, get you can't get likes and comments when you yeah, call but someone direct. But that's why I gotta put you. So now I know which box I gotta put you in. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I thought you was something other than what you are like okay so it's it's this fine it's no it's no it's no beef it's none of that it's just you know when you know when you see somebody say something you like because mm. i'm doing that a lot now too like people say certain things i'm no longer taking it just for what they said like i'm looking deeper into that comment now okay. like where did that come from because mm -hmm. people do that because people will tell you that they have an issue with you or they feel some type of way about you without really saying it mm -hmm. they'll say other shit and it's like oh that's interesting Coming off the Kendrick and Drake beef is that's what you want to say about me? Some niggas don't get a dap. Some niggas get a nod. Now some niggas don't get nothing. <laughs> mm. Like that's the that's the game. That's the that's the that's the balling part about it. When you just walk past niggas that you used to kick it with, and they know why. Oh, they know. They always know why. Like damn. Oh, he must have saw that. Yeah. Or he must have heard that. Or somebody must have told him what I said. Mm -hmm. Like it's always that when you when the energy goes from. How I usually am with people, like, yo, what's good? Da, da, da. To just straight, like, walk past them, they know, like, oh shit, he he heard. I hold on to those comments, though. I so, yeah, so as you can see from what Mo has been saying, he was really surprised and perturbed 
by some of the personal attacks he was probably getting from his friends. I don't think he was probably disturbed by how passionately the fans were getting at him. I think it was mostly the friends. But I have to kind of pick up this and say, I was perturbed by how passionately and how fiercely and how psychotically some people, psycho no, psychotically, whatever, whatever, whatever that fucking word is, defending their guy when the whole Kendrick and Drake thing was happening. It almost made me understand now why some people online don't like sport fans. I honestly understood why, because I'm a very passionate, I'm a very loud, I'm a very aggressive sport fan online. Some of you have probably followed me on Twitter. You know how how I get down when Matt and I are playing. You know, you know, I let it fucking fly. I say some crazy shit on there. And I think in general, that sort of like over, that sort of like eagerness to sort of like go crazy online to defend somebody that you don't know can come across a bit weird to people. Like, what the fuck? Why are you that invested in it? Like, chill out. But obviously some people see football as sport or sport as hip hop, whatever it may be. Cool, whatever. The, the main thing that I remember from the beef that really annoyed me was that it almost felt as if like, depending on who you're supporting, people had a, people judged your character and what you were like as a person based on who you're defending. So it almost seemed as if being a fan of Drake in that hip hop and Kendrick beef was almost like being a fan of Taylor Swift against Madonna. That's what it almost seemed like, or like, no, or Taylor Swift against Bjork. That's what it almost seemed like online. They were making it seem like, oh my God, how can you like Taylor Swift over... It was like, bro, Drake, I know you might not like his music, but Drake isn't fucking Taylor Swift. Let's be real for a second. Because the reality is, whenever the fucking Spotify wrapped list comes up and you mother... You lamos, I've never done it in my life, by the way, but you fucking, you know, redax, post your Spotify wrapped list of who you listen to, guess who's on there by hook and crook? Yes, bitch, you guessed it. The mulatto god. Of course... Because everybody says, everyone wants to look a certain way online and say certain things, underground this, whatever that. But your Spotify playlist doesn't fucking reflect that in the slightest. You've listened to all the bait people that we all listen to. So this idea that you are somehow way more cultured and intellectual and way more learned and way more clued in and plugged in because you like Kendrick over Drake was lame. Especially in the nature of the beef because the beef was a very singular, isolated, siloed thing. These two great people in their field going head to head, bar for bar, double for double. Who do you like best? It was actually an easier thing to judge, especially if you were a fan of the music, because guess what? We got some of the best music we've ever got from either party. If you're a fan of Drake, you've got fucking, what is it, four more songs that you can listen to this year that he probably would never have released because of the beef. If you're a fan of Kendrick, you got to hear from him in fucking the first time in years. Because he doesn't really put out runaways and whatever. He usually just puts all his work into albums. So for the fans, you fucking won. We all won because we've got the best content, the best fucking music, the best raps, the best melodies, the best choruses, the best even visuals from fucking both of these two guys. Even the visual that Kendrick did of the fucking man. And I realized it later on that those dots were fucking from, uh, I forgot the website, but the website where you go check fucking pedophiles and shit. That's where those dots were on Drake's mansion. How fucking genius is that? How fucking clever is that? I just assumed that was just like, oh, he Google mapped his fucking house. I'm going to be there with all my boys. I never thought that, that those red dots represented the eight people within Drake's crew who have some sort of fucking crazy shit on their jacket regarding kids or some sexual assault thing. I never knew that. I was like, what the fuck? Obviously the Drake thing with the video for Family Matters and how it moves in different, three different fucking phases. The end bit at the end, Family Matters. That, that last two minutes, 55, might be one of the best tracks we've ever heard from Drake in like the last five years. Not like us from Kendrick. When's the last time not Kendrick has given us a bop? When's the last time he's given us a fucking a bop? Come on, bro. The whole of LA is fucking shocking out to that shit. And fans online are fucking judging you. Oh, you must be a faggot because you like Drake. Oh, you must like fucking, you must only like Black Power music because you like Kendrick. It was so annoying, so lame. That's why I had to bow out of the fucking debates because people, people made it lame. The fans made it so fucking lame, especially the ones that were trying to read into everything. Oh, he said that line because actually he was born on the center solstice and when he was born, it was actually Earth, Moon, Shadow and his mum's name begins with M because her name's Maria. And like, shut up, shut up. Fermi la bouche. What are you talking about, bro? It's just rap, it's just hip hop. It's not that deep, man. These guys made it so lame and imagine, Losing friends over fucking hip hop. Losing friends because one of your friends like Kendrick and one likes Drake. Lame.
It's just as lame as those fucking motherfuckers back in the day. Or because you like Trump, I'm not going to be... People, people, people's families were broken in half because of Trump's presidency. That fucking wig herring, spray tan, donut guy broke your family up. Your family wasn't worth it in the first place. Your family is a, it deserves to get run over by a fucking semi. If, if that guy could break up your fucking family because one person voted for him. Who gives a fuck? It's not that deep. It's never been that deep. Really, honestly, I hated it. I'm so glad it's fucking over. I'm not gonna lie, I'm actually glad. I don't care who you think won, whatever. If you think Kendrick won, cool, enjoy yourself. If you think Drake won, cool, enjoy yourself. We got some tunes out of it. We got some summer bops out of it. We're probably gonna get some deep albums out of it too. So, because don't think the indirects are gonna stop. Drake, when he drops his new album, he's gonna still be sending for fucking Kendrick. Fucking Kendrick, when he drops his album, he's going to be sending for Drake. We're going to still get the fucking ongoing, but the debates online and the judging of people and almost like dismissing and, you know, belittling and just acting like a cunt to be like, God, uh, uh, you think you're a better human than me because you can recite fucking pimp to pimp a butterfly lyrics. Go dance in a fucking, go dance on train tracks, bro. Go dance on train tracks if you think you're better than me. It almost it always always reminds me of that time I went to fucking South London to a rave somewhere um with this person I used to know, right? Yeah, um, hope Corey dies. But when I went to this fucking rave in South London and um it was this like alternative like black rave thing, you know, you know, guys that wear fucking wooden beads and shit, you know that sort of malarkey, right? All that earth moon shower sort of nonsense shit. Everyone carrying a fucking camera and acting like they're photographers, girls with armpit hair being models and shit, all that sort of nonsense, right? All fucking posing on next to a wall, right? Everyone fucking in braids. Oh, your hair's not nappy. It's beautiful like that, all right? Whatever, yeah, cool. I remember being there, and this was at the height of when that song by Kendrick, We Gonna Be All Right, wherever that album was from, right? We Gonna Be All Right, wherever that album was, right? That's fucking the underground version of fucking, what you call it, of that, of that fucking Childish Gambino song, um, in my opinion. But anyway, regardless, it was playing, and I think I'm such a hater. I'm such a contrarian. When people were getting happy at the joint, like almost like as if they were in like a civil rights movement's march or something in this nightclub in South London somewhere, I, I was filled with rage because of how happy they were. I was just standing there like, fuck them, man. Like, lame. This guy, this motherfucker thinks he's Frederick Douglass because he's jumping up and down, reciting the bars to this fucking track. Anyway, this girl was like, she, she danced here and she was like looking at me like to try and recite the bars. Like, we gonna be up? And I was like, who's this? This is pretty good. This guy's... This guy's quite good at rapping, isn't it? He's quite good at rapping. He's got he's got a lot of potential. And the way her face fell, like, you don't, you don't know who Kendrick, who K Dot. By the way, if you're a fan and you refer to Kendrick as K Dot, go and dance at the nearest fucking motorway and fall over. Please. If you refer to Drake as the boy, please, please, please go and drown in a shallow pool. You're a fucking loser. Don't be that invested. These guys aren't your friends. But anyway, do you not know who K Dot is? I was like, no, actually, I just played dumb and the whole thing. And I love the fact that I brought that fucking sadness and that defeat to her face. She must she turned around like, oh, he's not a real black. He's not a real black. He doesn't know. He he can't recite all the lyrics from Most Def's album. He doesn't even know Most Def's name is Yasin Bey now. Like, go and dance somewhere else trying to judge me for my musical taste i like all things i'm a normie matcha latte drinking basic ass bitch i like everything if it's got a bop to it man's gonna fucking dance to it don't fucking judge me and be all high and mighty because you like fucking albums without fucking album covers go and dance somewhere please and preferably somewhere where you might die but again what do i know what do I know? Actually, I don't know why this ended is so toxic. You see what happens when you start engaging in fucking Twitter dis discourse? That place just makes you toxic. It's not me. It's them. <laughs> Big up DSP. I did everything right. I did nothing. I did everything correct. I did nothing wrong. <laughs> Yo, big up my guy DSP, man. I hope, you know, yeah, I hope you're good too. Anyway, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. Let's talk about this subject. Too. It's a worst of subject. Big up Cassie. So, um, Cassie released a statement just now regarding everything that occurred and the videos that have been shared online um, and just, you know, the ordeal she's been going through. She stayed, she's been quite stoic and steadfast and quiet regarding the whole thing. I'm assuming most of it has to do with the NDA and also because it's super painful and also what the fuck can you say to make it 
feel better. It's just one of those things you kind of have to just get through, you know? So um, big up Cassie for kind of maintaining her peace, not engaging in all the discourse online. I'm sure she's seen it and just kind of keeping quiet and focusing on her family and her friends, husband, all that good shit. Cause that's what's needed now, especially now that she's got the settlement money, you can kind of plan for the future and do some cool stuff and try and make the best of this. Try and make the best of the rest of your life, basically. You've gone through that shitty thing. Now you can kind of grow into it. That's probably the only benefit of that occurring while she was so young. Because I remember that's what broke my heart when I read the story that I think that Diddy got Diddy kind of jacked her from um what's his name Ryan Leslie when she was like nineteen or something. So he basically was her first introduction into the industry at large. He gave her a lot of her first like so they were tied to the hip for a long time. So it makes sense why she stayed around for so long. Even though abuse victims anyway take I think the average is like seven times until they actually leave. It made a lot of sense why she was around for so long. So she suffered for a long time as well. And at least the only silver lining from this is that it happened while she was very young. So you go through that sort of stuff young and it doesn't break you. It doesn't change how you view love and how you view relationships. It kind of informs you and it clues you up and widens you up and makes you kind of street smart very quickly. And you've also got a lot of time to repair that damage, you know? So with this settlement money, you'd assume she's probably got time to do what she needs to do and kind of make the best of this um, shitty situation. So she finally broke her silence and put out a statement on Instagram. Cassie said the following. Thank you all for the love and support from my family, friends, strangers, and those I have yet to meet. The outpouring of love has created a space for my young self to settle and feel safe now. But this is only the beginning. Domestic violence is the issue. It broke me down to somebody I never thought I would become. With a lot of hard work, I'm better today, but I will always be recovering from my past. Thank you to everyone that has taken the time to take... Why, why can't I read that properly? Thank you to everyone that has taken the time to take this matter seriously. My only ask is that everyone open your heart to believing victims the first time. It takes a lot of heart to tell the truth out of a situation that you are powerless in. I offer my hand to those that are still living in fear. Reach out to your people. Don't cut them off. No one should carry this weight alone. This healing journey is never ending, but this support means everything to me. Thank you. Love always, Cassie. So big up to Cassie. Much support, much love to her. Thoughts and prayers with her. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure she's got the right people around her. She's going to keep going on. And you think as well, for someone, for someone, for that to happen to you so young and for you not to crash out, is a sign that you're mentally a lot stronger than people realize. And you've also got the right people around you. So I think she'll be cool. But I was thinking a lot more about this because I've still yet to kind of really process the gravity of this situation. But then it all kind of clicked to me the other day when I was listening to the Love Album again. And I was like, oh my God, bro. This guy, Diddy, who I legitimately looked up to when I was growing up, who I saw as like an icon, a beacon, a kind of pillar a symbol, right, of like what you can achieve in the corporate world, in, you know, in, in, in the commercial world, in the business world, right, without actually having the requisite, let's say, talent to do the thing you're doing. Because I think he was like the first sort of like proper mainstream multi-hyphenate, right, slash, 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 slash. He did so many things, but he basically started from being an intern at a record label. The journey that we've all kind of walked down right we've had the same sort of journey all of us out there trying to work in a creative field entertainment field it always starts with doing some jobs for free and usually it can feel a little bit you know um it can feel a little bit pointless it can sometimes feel like you're not going anywhere it can feel like a waste of time it can feel maybe exploitative but diddy was proof that if you stick the course if you know what you're doing if you've got a bit of hard work effort if you've got a bit of a um, work ethic about you if you've got a, gr a grand vision if you execute at the highest levels you can get there or if you execute, sorry, every level that you're at, you can obviously get there. And I saw Diddy as those type of people because I remember watching, he was the first type of person that I kind of watched a lot of documentaries on on YouTube. I'd watched documentaries about his um, label, Sean John. I worked the documentaries about um, Bad Boy, documentaries about when he was running around with um, um, Biggie when he was alive. I'd watched documentaries on him trying to launch Revolt, documentaries on him when he first signed to Ciroc. So I was very well-versed, very plugged in, very aware of Diddy from a producer to a musician, to an artist, to a rapper, to whatever. Loved all of it. And I also loved the reinventions. Back then, I don't know if you remember, Diddy's reinventions were looked at as a good thing because it seemed like every every decade he would reinvent himself, either with a new name or a new aesthetic. White suits, black suits, pimp wear, sports wear, street. Like, he would always kind of reinvent himself. And I was always seen as like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. He's, even though he's older, he's always keeping up with the times without losing his essence of himself. But it's so heartbreaking to know the entire time he was doing that, especially at his peak, he was beating a young Cassie black and blue. 
And it's even worse when you actually rewatch the video that I did the other day. If you rewatch the video, the really heartbreaking thing about that video is that if you look closely enough, you'll notice Cassie's got white fingernail polish on. And if you remember the original lawsuit, they said part of the freak off attire, the freak off way of life was that Diddy demanded these girls to wear white um, nail polish and obviously um, what, you know, on the feet and on the hands. That's what they had to do. He liked them to look a certain way. So that was in the midst of a freak off, number one. Number two, if you notice watching that video, she doesn't have any shoes on. When she leaves that hotel room, she has no shoes on. And the story allegedly goes, I think in the lawsuit it says, Diddy punched her in the face in the room sometime. She got a black eye and she was, that was like her final straw. Okay, I'm leaving the guy. But she was so scared to wake him up and to kind of get his wrath that she must have removed her shoes in the room so she could sneak out quietly because he was sleeping. But unfortunately, he still heard her. And as you can see, when he when she gets to the hotel, when she gets to the to the lift, she presses the number, and you can almost see from body language, she's almost kind of she feels safe. She's like, oh, finally, the lift's coming. But little does she know that Diddy's running down the, the, the hallway. And while she's at the lift, she's also putting on her socks. So it's obviously intentional. She obviously took off her socks and her shoes in the room to try and creep out the room as quietly as possible. She felt safe the moment she pressed the down button on the lift. But little did she know. In like one second, Diddy will be behind her, kicking and punching her while she's on the floor, or kicking her and throwing shit at her. And then when you also watch the beating, it's so dismissed. It's so like, it's so brutal. It's so dehumanizing. Because somebody said the other day, oh, it looks like he's kicking a dog. You won't even do that to a dog. You would never kick your dog like that. Like, that's pure disgust and anger and contempt that he has, especially the bit where. He kind of pushes her into a corner and then sits on a chair in that kind of cocky like Diddy pose with his legs split. And then he throws a vase at her. Because in some psycho brain, you know, rationalization, maybe you could say the first pull at the hotel lift door is a moment of rage. You're running out of the room. You're fucking feeling aggrieved. And let's say you agree because Sharp from No Jumper had a fucking crazy opinion. Sharp from No Jumper was like, oh, he felt like from his experience, that looked like something like Cassie had stolen something from him. Like, as if Diddy was pissed off that she stole something and then he was running down. It's like, bro, it doesn't matter if she stole something. You don't fucking beat a woman like that. That's not what happens. You know what I mean? Anyway, that was Charles' opinion. But even if you think that, cool. Let's rationalize it and say that first sort of like violent exchange was quote unquote justified. If that's the case, when she's on the floor lying, lying in a, what's that thing called? In a prone position, she's almost playing dead. Then what? Then I think you're going too far because she's clearly not putting up a fight. She's not talking back at you because she looks like she's literally trying to cover her face. We can't hear the audio, but she seems kind of quiet. At one point, she seems like she went out. She it seems like when you hear on the floor, she kind of went out of consciousness. But I'm not too sure if you're just kind of trying to play dead. So you've you've dominated her. You've shown that you're more powerful, more strong, and you still kick. You still throw a vase at your head. Now you're a monster, bro. You deserve to be under the jail. And that's a really distressing heartbreaking shit about it is that as a fact as an actual fan even though i'm somebody that can separate the art from the artist when i see shit like that i don't think i can I'm, i swear to god i really don't think i can because the r kelly thing it didn't really matter cause I'm, I'm not really listening to r kelly like that anyway you know what i mean I, I i wasn't really he wasn't really my guy usher was mostly my guy even though they're not the same age range if i had to compare one i think i was more of an usher kid than i was a r kelly kid so when r kelly got cancelled i didn't really, didn't really give a fuck it didn't really affect my day to day. but the diddy thing has i'm not gonna lie because it's made it's made it hard to listen to that love album i said before love album was literally the album of the year and maybe one of his best works ever which makes sense as well because the worst people sometimes create the best art. They pour that fucking toxic negativity, darkness, whatever into their fucking music and sometimes it fucking bangs. But I don't even think I can listen to the guy now anymore knowing that that's how he gets down behind the scenes. Because think about it. That's a hotel. And he did that. Imagine what he was doing behind the scenes that we didn't see. Imagine what Cassie was going through behind closed doors. There, and there's videos. There's actually videos out there people have been able to put together. There's videos that we've seen online, allegedly, showing Cassie like four days after that event. And they, and again, this is at the time when they were like Bonnie and Clyde type of thing. Everywhere Diddy went, they asked about Cassie. Everywhere Cassie went, they asked about Diddy. No, and the interviewer has no idea, didn't know at the time, that for four days before that, Diddy was fucking beaten on the floor. And they're asking her about Diddy. And she's like, as a pro, 
her fucking professional face on. You can't even tell there's an issue. Answering uh, questions about him, how loving they are, what they do together as a couple, why they're soulmates, all this malarkey. And, and we have no idea that behind the scenes, she's getting beaten up by this man. So it's really impossible for me to look at the guy the same again. It really is. I can't separate the art from the artist anymore because I can't support or get down with somebody that will be up, that will hit women in the first place. And number one, especially women that you love in that kind of way, that's disgusting. But it also shows to me that there's other nefarious things going on behind the scenes. So now the whole lawsuit, I believe it. I believe everything in the lawsuit now. Even though I, I believed it anyway, I believed exactly what will happen to, to, to Cassie. The other stuff with Meek Mill, maybe you could be a little bit like, eh, whatever, the little rod shit. But the stuff that came in Cassie's lawsuit was fairly obvious to say that was true. The people out there that were waiting for the video evidence, you're insane. This woman was with, was with Diddy for a long time. They were very public about their relationship. Like, if anybody knows where the body's buried, it's fucking Cassie. So the fact that people were debating with what her intentions, like, bro, she's not even, she's never even spoken about the guy in public, I think, since they're broken up. Why would she suddenly want to clout chase? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Usually people clout chase in the moment of the fucking breakup. You get broken up, it gets announced on the blogs, you capitalize in it, you clout, you clout chase, you grift, you do whatever needs to be done. She disappeared. Married a civilian, like a model guy, like just a regular dude. Had a family, just completely went away. I don't think that's clout chasing. I think that's somebody finally having the courage to speak up and say something and put an end to that abuse because he's he was still doing it till this day. Don't be, you know, Young Miami, maybe she wasn't getting beaten up, but they were going through the same shit. Young Miami had the fucking white nail polish. Young Miami allegedly, according to Little Rod, was fucking smuggling pink, pink cocaine around for fucking Diddy. Freak ups are still happening to this day. So if Cassie never spoke up, freak ups, freak ups would have still been occurring. Imagine that. Think about that for a minute. If Cassie wasn't, if Cassie didn't file that lawsuit, freak ups would have still applied. But all this to say, I saw this video online. And I'm not going to lie, this video in particular made me think that, oh my God, this motherfucker is a legit animal. Look at this video from 2009. Big up, it's a vibe, aka Sound on Twitter for posting this. Um, the uh, He's got a channel called Club Ambition that does really good music video reactions and sorry, album reactions and shit. So I'm sure you know who the guy is. So check him out. He's really cool. He posted this clip of Diddy from 2009 on The Ellen Show. And in this particular clip, this is during the aftermath of Rihanna and Chris Brown when the when the picture of Rihanna and her injuries went viral, right? When Chris Brown allegedly, ass not allegedly assaulted her in the car, I think on the way back from some award ceremony somewhere when they were dating. And obviously that was a big deal. It kind of got Chris Brown cancelled. And, you know, it obviously um, was a bad look for Rihanna too because she got to look like the way she did. It was whatever. It kind of stirred a whole debate around domestic violence, domestic disputes. Blah, blah, blah. Cool. Bad times. Diddy was on the show, planned to be on the show anyway. But Ellen, obviously, you're a hip-hop person. You're a black guy. You're in the scene. You know both parties. So she kind of asked like an open-ended question about the situation. And look at how angrily, look at how visibly angry and annoyed Diddy is that he's been asked this question. Again, this is in the heat. And this is not like months after when you're a bit tired of the debate. This is in the heat of the moment. The event happened just a couple of days before and Ellen's just asking him the question, I think is a fairly fair question to kind of ask as a hip hop guy, as a black dude, as somebody that knows both parties. Hey, what do you think about the thing? And look at how angrily Diddy kind of replies and responds to fucking Ellen's question. He doesn't really seem happy in the slightest. I think this clip is very eye-opening in showing you that maybe we should have known from the beginning that Diddy behind the scenes was fucking up Cassie. Hold on, do I need to unmute something? Why is there no sound? Oh, there's no sound because of that. Whoopsie. Hmm. Why can't I hear sound? Let's refresh that. Where is the sound? Where is the sound? Where is the sound? Where is the sound? Can you play? The fucking sound. Where is the sound? Where is the sound? Where is the sound? Cool, let's go. Hard for me, and, and I don't believe in judgment either, but I don't want any girl out there thinking it's okay to go back to a guy who hit her. Yeah, I don't want yeah, any girl I, to think I, I don't, that. I don't, I don't, I don't think... And I don't mean to put you no, in no, that, no, no, it's not no, you. No, no. 
No, but you all you all put me in it. So so I'm gonna speak on it. Okay. I don't think it's I don't think that it's um right for anybody to hit anybody mm -hmm. at the end of the day. You see what she said? Ellen DeGeneres said very clearly there, I don't want any little girl out there to feel like it's okay for a guy to hit you and you to go back to them. Because I think that also was a time when Rihanna was literally obsessed with Chris Brown, as most girls were around the world. He was the legit, he's still a heartthrob now, but back then he was even more so. So she was basically just being, you know, fearful that Rihanna would go back to Chris Brown, which I think she did for a bit and then ended up breaking up again. But Diddy immediately went on the defensive. No, no, you are. I don't mean to put you in it. No, no, you are putting me in it, though. He was pissed off he'd be even being asked a fucking question. Let's play it for one more time for the beginning. It's a fucking odd, odd response to a very, I think, generic, open-ended question. Hard for me, and, and I don't believe in judgment either, but I, I don't want any girl out there thinking it's okay to go back to a guy who hit her. Yeah, I don't want yeah, any girl I, to I, think I don't, that. I don't, I don't, I don't think... But you all, you all put me in it, so so I'm gonna speak on it. Okay. I don't think it's, I don't think that it's um, right for anybody to hit anybody mm -hmm. at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think it's right, you know. I think that we all have to be honest with ourselves as adults, and and people have been in relationships, you know. We know sometimes those relationships get ugly, you know, and sometimes it doesn't come out into the forefront the way this one has come out. And it's a lot of stones being thrown, and we don't know exactly what's going on these are two young individuals we need to pray for them and we need to give certain support but you don't need to start just saying that you know something that you don't know you wasn't in that car i, was I wasn't in that car and it isn't right for him to put his hands on her or her to put his hands on him and we don't know what the problem is but we need to pray for them and we need to do things to support them and that's all i want to say about it i agree with Thank you. you i want to support them Here's gonna... jesus look how mad he is Look at how, I, I honestly forgot. I remember watching this when it happened, but I forgot how angry and how visibly full of rage he looked during this whole entire segment. Now I understand, there is a part of it where you can kind of understand Diddy's frustration. You go on the Ellen show to promote whatever you want to promote, and then you're getting quote-unquote ambushed about this topic that has nothing to do with you. I can understand why you could be annoyed in that regard. But because of the sense, because of the severity of the situation, because of how raw it is, because of how sensitive the topic is, in that moment, just play the fucking game. Domestic violence, bad. I abhor any guy that hits a woman. It's fucking not a man to me. It's disgusting to see that sort of stuff. It's heartbreaking. I send my thoughts and prayers out to fucking Rihanna. That's it. Done. Cue for fucking break. You come back and then you start fucking Harlem shaking. That's okay. But in the moment, he got annoyed. Like, And even Ellen tried to be like, I know I know, it's not your issue. Sorry for bringing this up. You could be like, no, it's okay. I completely understand why you're bringing up Ellen. Um, obviously, I wasn't there. I don't know these. I don't know much about what's going on. I've seen the pictures like everybody else. But it obviously broke my heart when I saw it. I've got two young... You can even do that whole thing. I hate that whole I've got daughters thing because it almost means as if if you didn't have daughters, you wouldn't understand that domestic violence bad like i don't really understand that kind of language or that kind of phrase um or that phraseology that people use out there but you can even run with that narrative oh i've got a mom i've got an auntie i love i've got a grandma i love i've got a daughter i love blah 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 but did he didn't so this was a sign from 2009 that this guy's been a bad fucking dude very bad because something in his spirit got triggered and this that goes back to the whole like whatever does whatever happens in the dark always comes to light which I remember used, I used to hate when my parents would say that to me back in the day because they almost, you know, you know, African parents, they, they almost say these type of things as like a, I almost say like as a threat, but almost like a way to keep you in line. <laughs> it's, um, my dad always be like, oh, I had a dream about you going out and something, but it's like, bro, nothing bad happened. You, you just don't want me to go outside. Just say you don't want me to go out. Ground me if you want, but don't, like, you had, so you had some vision that I got swallowed by a snake on the way there or a whale jumped out of the fucking central line and fucking ate me whole. Like, come on, not that deep. But to be fair to my parents, they were right on two things. And they're still right on two these two things. Nothing good happens after 9 p.m. <laughs> and what happens in the dark <laughs> will always come to light. And this is the proof of it. This guy's a billionaire. Top of the fucking food chain. Apex predator. When they say, um... When they say fucking, um, what's that term they use in fucking, in the manosphere? When they say high value male, Diddy's face would be on the definition of a high value male. He is the fucking capital H in high value male. And he has all the resources, all the enablers, all the dick suckers, all the clout chasers, 
all the in all the excuse makers, all the look the other way is, all the head in the sanders to get away with murder, legitimate murder. If you believe some of the rumors and the conspiracy theories, Ooh, who killed Tupac? Oh, who really killed Biggie? Oh, who really killed Kimball? Oh. If you really believe the stories, he could get away with absolute murder. But look what happened. Eventually, it had to be revealed. Eventually, it came to light. And the most unsuspecting person was the one that brought it to light. D dear old Cassie. Little old, you know, quiet, meek, shy Cassie. Me and you, she's the one that fucking said, it's me and nothing. Yeah, you know I mean, she fucking got him the fuck out of here. So that's what I'm happy to see. But again, as a fan, it's been heartbreaking because you see somebody, you, you can separate the art and the artist, but somebody like a Diddy, he's all encompassing. You want you want to emulate the whole life, the whole lifestyle. You want so, it's something to aim to look up to. Like, oh my God, wow. You can be unapologetically black in these type of spaces. You can promote and push this certain aesthetic. You can have this certain taste level. You can be unabashedly like, you know, um, on it in terms of success and, you know, m money and wealth and cars and guilt. Like you can be this, this, what I like to envision, like a quintessential idea of a playboy in that respect, right? It's kind of like, in a weird way, I kind of maybe so even Diddy, like a, like a straight version of Tom Ford, if that exists. Because Tom Ford, that's the thing with Tom Ford. He's like a real, like, designer's designer, super smart businessman, really dashing, handsome dude. But if you think about it, he's also kind of boring. Doesn't really party. He had he's, he's had a husband since, you know, early times. He's not really. I mean, he's he's not really that kind of like. But when you see Diddy, was that to me the kind of straight version of kind of Tom Ford for the fashion, the movies, the music, the lifestyle, the the fucking you know liquor, fragrances, the books, even Revolt. When Revolt first started, it was like you know ah, oh, when the fucking empower black people have the first black network, blah 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 blah, and it's like look what it turned out to be. Look what it turned out to be. A, a fucking, a house built on fucking sand, a charade. And um, as Mo and Rory said, he's definitely a false idol. Um, we shouldn't obviously idol celebrities anyway. We should always just enjoy their art. I think this whole idea of putting celebrities on a fucking pedestal is null and void, especially because we don't know these people. We don't know how they are. We don't even know our own family members who do some fucking madness. So the fact that we can look at a fucking celebrity and be like, oh my God, you're so amazing. It's fucking bizarre. So um, um, it's for the good. Again, um, force and feelings go out to Cassie. Um, what an amazing and very well considered fucking um, statement she put out there. I love it. Um, and I hope she can have all the healing necessary and kind of go from there. So big up Cassie. Big up Cassie. Big up Cassie. Big up fucking Cassie. Moving on from that one. Let's move on to some streetwear stuff before we adjourn. I'm surprised at this. I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm actually surprised at this. I'm sure some of you guys who are way more intelligent than I am, who have way more insight, who are maybe a little bit more plugged in on the industry will probably be not surprised. But I'm actually legitimately surprised by this news, courtesy of WWD. VF hired Goldman Sachs to consider selling Supreme, sources said. Yes, you heard that correctly. VF Corp is considering selling Supreme. Really? I was like, what? Like, considering, like, the amount of money they paid for it, the, the, the fucking growth of Supreme in the last few years, I think they've opened maybe four stores since VF Corp bought them. It's really surprising that they'd want to sell. You'd think Supreme is, like, a very high-value asset. You'd imagine so. Especially considering how long they've been around. Like, well, anyway, whatever. It, I guess not. I guess the business... Because people like this don't just sell because of just for the fun of it they usually sell because the numbers just don't make sense so let's see what the article says the future is coming for supreme financial sources said the luxury streetwear brand is that what this has been referred to as a luxury streetwear brand i, I wanted it's just a streetwear brand i don't that's the whole thing i think which makes supreme special and even stussy to a certain extent these are like legacy heritage old school streetwear brands that have just been long enough they've been around long enough they put out enough good work to a high enough level that they can be sold in a skatewear shop, a skate stop, sorry, a skate shop, a streetwear store, menswear store, and a high fashion store. But it doesn't mean they're luxury. They're just really good at what they do. It's at a really high level and people across the board would want to wear them. Like you don't call Adidas Sambas luxury, you know, sneakers just because fashion people wear them. So the term luxury streetwear is really weird in my personal opinion. Either it's fashion, either it's streetwear, but luxury streetwear doesn't really exist, in my personal opinion. But again, what do I know? The brand is quietly being shopped around to potential buyers that VF Corp, which bought Supreme for $2.1 billion in 2020, is working with Goldman Sachs to review the portfolio at large. So, you know, 
most likely they are going to get a profit on their fucking purchase, right? If they bought the company for 2.1 billion, they're probably going to get more than that if they sell it now in 2024 and onwards, for sure, right? You'd imagine so. While VF Corp has been public about its desire to spin off parts of its business, it has not disclosed that it's working with Goldman or Supreme with was one of the biggest tagged sales. A spokesperson for VF said, as a matter of policy, we do not comment on markets, rumors or speculation. A spokesperson from Goldman Sachs declined to comment. Supreme has been something of a fascination for fashion and for the uh, deal makers who watched a private equity giant, Carlyle, invested in the business at $1 billion at valuation in 2017 and then doubled its money with the VF deal. Oh yeah, true. Both of these sales pr prompted questions about how the ultra buzzy and quirky Supreme would it set the agenda in streetwear, luxury streetwear, sorry, would fare under corporate ownership. The business has grown, but its light has faded somewhat. The brand got too big to continue to be cool, said that it's one investment banker. It didn't help that under VF, Supreme ran into some supply chain problems in 2022, a surprising turn of events given the strength of VF traditionally showed in that area. So supply chain issues and the fact that they're waning as a brand. I don't think that's, that's the thing. That's, maybe I'm viewing it as like a fanboy, but I don't think v Supreme has really waned. If anything, they just put out too much product. I don't think there's enough exclusivity around Supreme anymore. Obviously, the high ticket, high value things still sell out for the most part. But I think because of the amount of stores they have, because of the amount of money they've invested into their online store, into e-commerce, they just have to make more quantities to fulfill those kind of spots. Not even maybe supply, just to fill those kind of retail outlets and shit. That's basically it. And I think that's kind of watered down the brand because part of the reason why the brand was always great was because they made great stuff and it also sold out quickly so that you have the ability to buy it because they made quite a lot of it because they had big stores in most of the big locations. But you wouldn't have the danger of having everybody wearing the same shit you wore because if it was something that was in demand, more than likely it'd sell out in that day or in that week. So that would kind of take it out. But nowadays, especially with the prevalence of like online resellers, nothing really sells out, really, technically. If you want something, you can buy it. Like the Futura Dunks that just came out now. I miss them because I'm not on fucking sneaker as I should be. I don't have my alerts on and I turn off notification like an idiot. But I miss the, the, the Futura um, Dunk SBs, right? The, the ones that just came out recently. You just go on fucking StockX and they're 350 pounds. I just saw the other day. Maybe the price has gone up now. But if you want a pair of shoes, they're desperately enough. You can buy them. As long as you're willing to pay like double, you can buy them. So the idea of limited edition doesn't really exist anymore because there's so many people out there buying shit to resell. There's so many people out there buying shit to be cool. There's so much people supplying that shit that it almost takes away the limited edition thing. To be limited edition now, you have to literally do what Cortese does and other brands where you have like flash drops and then you fucking close the store and no one can buy it anymore. You know what I mean? And you also make smaller quantities. That is the only way to do it. If you're operating at like a supreme level, it's almost impossible to be limited because how are you limited when you have stores, when you have like four stores in Southeast Asia, right? Like how many stores do they actually have? It's it's pretty, it's a lot. Like at the moment, last time I checked, it's, it's not a small amount. They have a large amount of stores. So can you really be limited edition if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 stores. 17. And of those 17, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in Southeast Asia. How's that? How are you going to be limited? 8 in Southeast Asia. That's not, that's not limited all in the sides, is it? In my personal opinion. But again, what? and, and, and if I'm not mistaken, aren't they going to open a second one in Italy? I heard the rumor that they've got one in Milan. There's going to be a second one in Italy. I'm not sure where, but it's meant to be a second one in Italy. So that's fucking, that's a lot of fucking stores. But again, I still think Cache, cool level, they're still there. You see someone you don't know with a Supreme hat on, you still think they're a bit cool. I don't think you look at them like they're a dork. I think now that you see somebody in a Bape Shark hoodie, it's a bit lame. Like, you know, you see them in a Billionaire Boys Club jumper, a bit lame. But I think if you see a kid now wearing a Supreme hat or like a guy, like an adult, wearing like a Supreme trench coat or a Supreme backpack, you're like, oh shit, that guy knows what's up. Do you know what I mean? You don't look at it as lame. I don't think so anyway. Maybe I could be in the wrong and I'm in denial, but I don't think that's the case. I think they should be okay to ride that storm. 
In fiscal 2023, VF talks 750 million in charges against the goodwill and indefinite lived trademark of Supreme, tied to higher interest rates and foreign currency fluctuations. As those charges were logged, VF Now's outgoing chief financial officer, Matthew Puckett, acknowledged that Supreme's business was uneven that year. Ugh. Okay, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am waffling. The chief financial officer of VF, the people that actually have the money, they actually have the sales in front of them. They actually have the accounting in front of them every day. They're doing the fucking V lookups and pivot tables and shit. He said the word uneven. Oof. Okay. But things have perked up since then. And Pocket had a more bullish update on the brand in October, reporting double digit growth. Okay. So he went from uneven to double digit growth. He said, the August opening of the August opening of Supreme's new store in Seoul in Korea is off to a terrific start and has delivered impressive results across a number of metrics. A strong proof point on the roadmap of our grow word grow wide strategy, which is aimed to expanding access to the brand to consumer glo Oh, so they did. This is actually an, an expansion plan. See, that's the issue about ex accepting investment. When you accept investment from these big investment, you know, fucking brands or whatever yeah investment firms when they put money into your company you can't then dictate terms they dictate terms so if they give you 2.1 billion and they say we want to have 10 stores in southeast asia by the end of 2024 you have 10 stores you can't argue you can't debate you can't push back they just gave you 2.1 billion like they are your bosses now essentially um which obviously is hard to kind of manage but you know, because with rapid growth comes rapid decline because how are you going to sustain that over a period? Especially nowadays, I think people don't really, people kind of underestimate how much those like smaller, what I'd like to call like, you know, Instagram brands have done to Supreme. Like the likes of like Hellstar and shit. Those type of brands, even Cortez in the UK. I think those type of brands have taken a, a bit of a, a, a chunk out of their potential sort of like market share and a lot of the kids that would buy supreme are now more prone to support a hell star because they follow the founder and he's cool and he shares pictures of behind the scenes and he's sharing motivational things like he said or he's saying motivational things that like the Cortez guy says so you feel a little bit more of a personal connection to it you see the, the brand grow from making side bags and t-shirts to now making fucking full waterproof zip-ups and shit so you want to support the journey so i think kids nowadays are probably more prone to support the journey of that or make their own brand than they are to support Supreme, especially now that it's become like a global phenomenon, a global phenom. Um, it continues. Most recently, he said the brand has seen a positive momentum. Um, there have been other setbacks along the way, they said. The brand hired Tremaine Emery as creative director, only to see him leave in August over what he described as systemic racial issues at the brand. The brand disagreed with the characterization at the time. Founder James J.B. still runs Supreme and remains a well-respected industry, but has had to navigate some pretty choppy waters at VF, where the brand has been part of a much larger target picture. The fact that they mentioned Tremaine in this is interesting. So the craziness with Tremaine might have painted Supreme in a bad light in how they run as a business day-to-day -day, office wise which makes sense because i think one of the positive or one of the i think truthful observations from um tremaine and that whole supreme thing what he said was like the culture around like the c-suite of the people in there where they were kind of clicky they all kind of sucked up to fucking james jebbia no one really challenged ideas or brought fresh ideas to the table um um, James kind of like maybe micromanaged a bit too much and didn't maybe leave people to do their own thing, which is understandable too how he micromanages because basically his micromanaging has is what has led to Supreme being you know has has led to them having an investment of what two point one billion. That's why because he fucking cares, right? He was there when the store first opened, sweeping his floors, and now he's still there paying attention to the details. You know, in his old age, even though he doesn't need to, and he has more enough people to do it. The fact that he has that hands on approach is what makes Supreme great. But obviously, if you're going to hire a creative director, you have to give them space to do their shit, even if it's wrong. Even if you don't like the idea of them fucking having, you know, images of slaves whipped on the fucking t-shirt and shit, that's all against what you're about. You have to give them the opportunity to fail, basically. And maybe he didn't give them pe the people space. And maybe the culture around it doesn't, you know, because you can imagine too, VF Corp probably don't even, I didn't, again, this is just, from the ob observation of knowing how companies are and how, how the culture changes in the company when an investment firm comes in and buys it out or buys a portion of it you see the culture change or you get absorbed it's happened to me once i wouldn't be surprised if vf corp also put some pressure on supreme in who they hired or who they even fired so maybe the whole creative director role came about because of vf corp 
Maybe Tremaine got hired because VF Corp wanted to paint Supreme as this like diverse thing, give it another sort of message out front. Now I mean that he could have he could have actually been a, a diversity hire as Kanye kind of like laughed at him about, but that could actually be the reason why, which also might explain why it didn't work out because he was seen as a bit of an op. He was sort of seemed like a bit of a spy in a way. Hey, you're VF Corp guy. We didn't really want you. I mean, that, it could that could be part of the whole weird conspiracy of what went on around there. But shoo, the fact that they mentioned it obviously is proof that something it went on there. Um, it continues. VF has annual sales um, that approach 11 billion. Owns footwear centric brand Vans, Timberland, Ultra, Performance Apparel, Smartwool, Icebreaker, outdoor brands The North Face, and another one called Napa Jiri and workwear named Dicky. Oh, but Napa Jiri, I remember them. They're the ones that did a collaboration with Martin Rose, isn't it? They kind of fall. I feel like they kind of fell off a bit, but they were doing some really hard stuff. Napa Jiri. Um, the company's backpack business, including Kepling, Eastpack, and Jansport, is in the midst of a sale um, process already. It's not clear how many of the brands VF Corp is looking to ultimately sell, but the portfolio has been under microscope for some time. Activist investor um, Engage Capital pushed for the company last year to consider selling all of its brands except for the large but struggling Vans and the company traditional powerhouse North Face. Wow. So Vans and North Face are way more financially stable than Supreme is. I would never have thought that. I'm not going to lie. I know obviously Vans is a legacy brand cool, but I would never have thought North Face. But it makes sense though, because whenever I pass the North Face in Westfield Stratford, bro, it's always booming. There's people in there shopping. Like pe People be having money. And North Face jacket, I'm not sure about you guys, but if you try to buy like a Fugazi North Face jacket, the difference between that and an actual legit one from the store is night and day. So I think a lot of people are like, you know what, I'd rather save my money and buy a free 50 Noopsy from North Face store than buy like a 50 pound one from some Chinese factory somewhere that's going to come looking like a fucking piece of paper and then I have to fluff it up in the washing machine with a tennis ball and all that malarkey. Do you know what I mean? So I see a lot of people actually buying legit things from there like sh even t-shirts i hear a lot of people love the shorts in supreme sorry north face so interesting isn't it interesting because you'd think if you're v if the business was good vf corp would keep a hold of the big brands right and supreme would be one of them you'd let go of all the brands that aren't really contributing to your bottom line and get rid of the rest but it seems supreme aren't doing that well it continues for years vf corp has major portfolio play in fashion and has more active than most uh spinning off brands that no longer fit the vision and buying up new properties but something different is going on this time after years of go go growth from vans the brand has lost its edge and it started to rely too much on classic looks and headed into a protracted downturn the hit just as a company faced a 875 million tax bill tied to a 2011 acquisition of timberland as a debt accumulated in a supreme deal weighed on its balance sheet sometimes this money you see on business articles is just crazy can you fathom can you fathom the day that you would check your fucking current account your check-ins account and see the amount of 875 million could you imagine what you would do with that sort of money <laughs> like these guys just cure companies have that debt riot off or it's just there in the background like could you imagine what you could do with 875 million dollars God damn. God damn. God damn. The first thing I do is go to that fucking that that fucking strip club in fucking Shoreditch, that whole house. If you know what I mean. If you've been around, you know. The first thing I do is fucking divorce the wife, abandon the kids, and go to that whole house in Shoreditch across the road from the Tesco. You know what I mean? I'll just say, hey, here's here's a meal. Run my tab. Anyway, altogether, it is too much for VF and the company's share price plummeted over a hundred dollars at the start of 2020 um and tuesday when it took a stock clean of 0.3 percent um steve rendell president and chairman and chief executive officer left abruptly in 2022 and was replaced by last year by a person called logitech international ceo bracken Darrell, who is looking at the business with new eyes uh, Darrell has been focused on the future, but when pressed by WWD in an interview in February, he said that the prior engagement ran their play well, buying brands that could benefit from the company's mocked, sorry, uh, rock solid supply chain. And then he said VF Poor lost the plot a bit. It must be fun to be a CEO in it. I always thought I would want to be more of a creative director, but a creative director is a good role, but it's just a bit of a cool job role, a cool guy role. Obviously, you know, overseeing the brand vision and design and strategy and all this sort of shit from a creative kind of point of view is cool. And seeing how that can kind of contribute to the long-term success of the company or short-term is cool. But I think being a CEO and applying your business acumen 
to different types of companies, different type of brands, different types of markets, different types of customers in different times of the year, different, you know, periods of their business, ups or downturns. That must be so fun, so exhilarating. Whether you fall flat on your face or whether you be or whether you turn it around, it must be so rewarding to go to because you know you have to make the hard decisions. You have to hire, you have to fire and hire. Um, you have to fucking re-strategize. You have to fucking lock in. It it just requires so much, you know, thinking overview of having every. You have, basically have to have knowledge of every part of the business at least surface level. You have to kind of know what's going on in sales, ops, this, that, import, export, boom, 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 boom. And then that kind of informs what you kind of do in terms of the business overall. And you have to make some hard decisions. You cut that team by 50. You fire everybody here. You rehire there. You have, it's almost like a, you know, it's almost like you're making a movie in real time. Like it's fucking wild. It must be so fun, but such a hard job to do. But if you do do it, your CV is nuts. Like you go from like, oh yeah, head of, you know, head of Samsung, CEO at Samsung, CEO at this place, that place, this place. Like so much range and breadth in terms of your experience. Like people will be looking at you thinking, rah, this guy is the guy, isn't it? This guy is the motherfucking guy. Look at the work that he's done in all these different places. Like they must look at you like, whoa. So yeah, like I like, I like the CEO role, man. It sounds fucking smart. It sounds fucking smart. Let's move on. Let's move on. So we did that. We've spoken about a little bit of Supreme and how they're trying to move things around and how things are going to change. If they're going to change, if they're not going to change. And we hope that is the case going forward. We really do. Next, I want to talk about these because I'm surprised no one has mentioned these. Maybe they have. I haven't really seen it. I want to talk about the Nigel Sylvester, the Nigel Blood Clark Sylvester Jordan 4s. Have you motherfuckers seen this? First look at the Nigel Sylvester and Air Jordan 4 R RM Pro Green. I've never heard of this model before this Nigel Sylvester colorway, but essentially from what it looks like, it looks like a hybrid of like a Jordan 4 and an Air Flight 89. It almost looks like that type of thing, but it looks way harder. Like this is fucking cool. So if you know Nigel Sylvester, Pro BMX rider and um, Nike athlete, I think he's actually signed as an athlete under the Jordan brand for some reason. I don't sure why. Um, I think they're trying to make Jordan brand like an all-encompassing lifestyle brand instead of just basketball, which is shit really. I'd much prefer Nigel Sylvester to be under a BMX kind of umbrella and have him be the marquee guy. Like if they had like a BMX division, like that'd be fucking sick. Like you make BMX specific shoes, but I guess they want to just add to the fucking inflate the sales and make Jordan brand look a little bit more better than it is than having a little kind of, you know I mean, it's, it's a nonsense really. He should have his own, it, it should be his own BMX division and Nigel Sylvester should be leading it because Nigel Sylvester is the most, you know, I think the most famous BMXer out there. I don't really follow BMX like that anyway, but he's the one that I know the most. He's most visible. Um, he's super cool. He's been with Nike for a long time. I think that would have been a good thing to have. But anyway, whatever. We got this shoe and it's fucking beautiful for me personally. You have the Jordan 4 lower um, part with the midsole and the, and the outsole here. You have the conventional Jordan 4 upper here, but then you have a little bit of a different sort of like upper bit around the middle where you have a lot of this kind of like plastic overlays. Some bits here, obviously, to increase the tension of the shoes. So you kind of wrap the lace around this plastic overlay. And then when you tighten it, it will obviously tighten and constrict the middle part here. So you can kind of wrap around your foot a little bit more. And it's more of a low than a mid. So, you know, Jordans, usually the tongue comes up just above your fucking ankles and the, the tab comes up just above your heel. So it's a bit more of a mid type of shape. But this particular Jordan 4 um, RM is a bit more of a low shape. So it kind of reminds me again, like I said, of like an 89, which are the, the Air Flight 18 and it's kind of a mid, kind of a of a high. It's kind of like a quarter size. And this kind of feels a bit like it. It's kind of quarter, kind of low, but I also really like it. And I love the addition of the little swoosh here at the front. This swoosh at the front of the shoe is something that you used to see a lot on like Co.jp Nikes. So like Nikes that are made exclusively for the Japanese market would always have this little cool, um, you know, swoosh at the front. You also see... Sometimes a lot of like European exclusive Air Maxes that have the little swoosh in the front. The one I can think of the most the iconic one is the Nike Atmos Air Max One, the one with the elephant print on the front of it. If you guys remember that one, the one with the cement, yeah, those ones. So I remember actually, I got a really fun story about these. In in an area I used to live in, I remember one shop weirdly had a pair of these. 
this particular Atmos Safari that they released in 2016, right? No, sorry. It released much older than that. That's a retro. Where's the OG? The OG model released much, much later than that. Much, much older than that. That's that. That's not the OG. But anyway, there's an OG version of this particular shoe, uh, of this particular Safari Atmos shoe. Let me do Safari. Maybe it'll come up. Um, the OG model that this barber shop near me was selling, but they didn't know what it was. And I remember walking past the barber shop. It's like it came out originally in 2005. That, there we go. So it originally came out in 2005. I, I had this shoe, and I remember buying it from the barber shop. And unfortunately, the, the shoe was in the front window was really dyed, so it was really um sun damaged. So it's kind of yellowed up and shit. But I ended up flipping it and selling them. I think if I remember at the time for like a thousand pounds or something. They were randomly at some barbershop I used to live near. Like, and this was before, way before the fakes. The fake market wasn't what it was now. So they definitely weren't fake. They are 100% real. But if I'm not mistaken, they were like B-samples as well. Because I think one foot was kind of defective. But I ended up selling them to somebody on Nike Talk for like a thousand or something crazy. And I used to remember, that's what bit I liked about them the most. Was this little swoosh here at the front of the shoe. So I love the fact that Nigel Sylvester's kind of taken that sort of like classic Nike thing. that you, Oh, look at these, by the way. Oh, look at the shape on these. Where's that one with the with a cloudy bubble? Look at that. You see what I mean about the shape of shoes? I know this person's put like a little stuff in them, but why can't Nike remake shoes from the ground up to have this type of spec, have this type of shape? Look at that. Look how flat that is. Look how big that bubble is. Like, imagine these shoes in like a... Imagine this particular colorway in the big air window, Air Max we have now. They look so fucking hard. Like, oh, I fucking love them. Anyway, cool. Um, so I like that Nigel Silvestre has taken that kind of like classic Nike design with the Code JP sort of like small swoosh at the front but at the front of the toe box and sort of applied it here to his Jordan. Um, and it's obviously in olive green, new buck as well, beautiful, great. I think it's a great color for like riding a lot because you're going to end up scuffing them and busting them up and water damage and shit and it's going to die out and there's going to be the plastic bits here are going to still be this nice pine green but the body's going to be kind of washed out so you get that kind of nice contrast going on as you're wearing them i fucking love it and as well as you can see here i'm not sure if you can see but i think in particular i don't know if this is true but i think they've done something to the toe box so even though the Nike Jordan 4 SBs, the toe box of the Jordan is a lot more thinner, a lot more flat than the normal Jordans, which is what they've applied to now the regular ones, like the reimagined ones, which I personally like, that silhouette better. I think they've done the same thing with these because if you're riding BMX, depending if you're riding, you know, different, different, depending anyway, but usually the pedals are going to be kind of small. So it's kind of nice to have like a smaller kind of, profile in the front of your toes so you kind of feel more contact with the with the with the pedals and if you do have cages on your pedals you can fit them in and out because regular jordan sometimes the the jordan's too big the toe box is too fucking fat and high to fit normally in regular cages which is why usually people like me that cycle a lot i ride like i ride fixed and stuff and whatever it may be like commuting around i usually like to wear vans I usually like to wear Vans. I usually like to wear like, you know, Converse's and shit. Just something with a more of a flat silhouette of a flat kind of peak so that I can get them in and out of my, sh of my, um, what you call it, of my pedal straps. Because I usually use like Velcro pedal straps to be like a little cool kid. So I really like the addition of those as well. Um, you've also got them, obviously, another picture there on the top in the green. I love the really low, le the really low tongue, by the way. It's not super high, easy to wear. I really fucking like the look of that. But a really nice shoe. Honestly, I've never heard of the RM before, but he fucking smashed them. They look really fucking good. And look at the back of the heel. That's a fucking nice touch. So on the back of the heel where you normally have the massive plastic wing, it's kind of been cut off and mis min minimized. And it's also almost, it's almost like a web design here, but it, where you have Nike written on the swoosh, he has bike, bike air, which again makes no sense because it's a Jordan, but it's BMX, but then it's Nike air. So like, come on, just, just give him a fucking BMX brand instead of pushing him in Jordan. But anyway, regardless, I guess the Jordan thing is mostly because a lot of BMXers, uh, I'm assuming the Jordan thing is maybe because of his preference. He, he loves Jordans. And I'm also assuming within the BMX scene, people wear Jordans. Jordan 4s, Jordan 1s, 2, 3s, whatever. Um, but I would have still preferred him to be underneath that banner. But anyway, the actual article of it says, courtesy of um, Hypebeast, uh, what it says here, famed BMX rider Nigel Tavessa and Jordan Brand are set to shake things up with the Air Jordan R4 RM. Initially reported last month, the rumored Jordan RM um, collaboration is stated to arrive later this summer. The sneaker surfaced in the form of a leaked image that hit the internet as well as the tease video of the BMX rider himself. Now a new colorway has been revealed, showing the Air Jordan 4 RM arrive in a pro green hue. Surfacing online via Greg Yuna. Um, so we've got a pair available in fucking green. Um, let me actually see. There's actually a video of him actually where he's skating 
making the fucking shoe look amazing so let's see if i can actually get that on social media to, to show you i think the video of it of him actually skating in it looks fucking sorry actually riding in the pair of shoes makes them look that much special than what they actually are um so really big up that aspect of it because that's a big part of selling these type of things oh i don't know why it keeps doing that but let's uh let's do it one more time let's go on this greg Una guys page and let's just get the post up and see if that works that way because i want to check out this video i think this video is absolutely hard and large large and hard so that's the greg Una guy he's got loads of i guess he does jewelry let's go down and check the fucking nigel sylvester post let's go to his account and i think we're going to have a video here uh that will be able to see him actually riding in the pair where is it oh okay there's him riding in the travis scott's where is it i don't know um, maybe he doesn't have it maybe there's not one video there maybe it's a video i actually passed on that guy's page but you don't actually see a video of him riding there but yeah he's a cool dude as you can see from his instagram all the cool guy things so let's actually see the video from this greg Una dude let's see what this is saying maybe we can get an idea on what the, the shoe looks like as he's skating in them there we go yeah see there, there's him sitting down having a good time but yeah we don't need to watch the video it is what it is you, you get the gist so um the shoes look fucking sick now look at the other colorways look at the other colorways that are leaked too there's this colorway too available which is the black light and bone and then finally there's this colorway look at this one in this oxidized green so you've got this all white outsole and then you have this green upper like two really good colorways and very different approaches to them as well like really fucking cool so in this particular colorway you've got um a nice bl block of i guess you'd say i wouldn't say it's off white it's more like a really light cement color at the bottom here you've got this really nice cement mud guard here as well um in this new buck finish which looks incredible and an all black upper which is great you've also got a difference in the eyelets and stuff you've got rein i think will look like reinforced eyelets you've got this almost hemp design here on the top and you've also got tubular laces the ones that you're more familiar to see in like a pair of sbs which is a bit different to the one we saw previously and you've also got this a bit a bit more of a softer plush sort of like heel counter there going on which makes them look really cool and then in the other one which is the oxidized green colorway you've got the same sort of makeup so i think it's a, this is the same sort of pack but this is just with the green colorway here on the top and then you've also got the same sort of plush landing here in the back but they both look really fucking nice like i'm a big fan of these like really am this is an actual good model hopefully they make these in good quantities so they're available for everyone to purchase easily but this is a really good like pro bmx shoe so i guess maybe the one that he has has the bike one because we don't have bike on here this says nike and the other one says bike so maybe that particular first colorway we saw is like an exclusive maybe that's the or maybe this is his signature model maybe that's the one maybe that this particular one is his yeah maybe this is his collaboration because what nike do really well is that when they reintroduce new shoes they usually introduce them under a collaboration unless the only retro i can think of that never really got that was maybe an air max light but usually big shoes retros that they bring out or even new models they usually have to do it with a collaboration first so they'll collaborate with a big person influencer an artist designer whatever and then they'll put it out as a gr later on down the line so a good example is a matthew williams matthew williams did a pair of air force ones recently that had a very simple design at the front um i think the matthew williams air force ones i think in low i think it was an air force one low um it had a really it had like an interesting paneling design at the front so i think that particular silhouette and shape will be a gr soon i haven't seen them yet but they launched them exclusively with matthew williams um you know and then i guess that down the line they'll definitely figure out a way to put it out as a gr but to kind of call you know attention and get people to buy them you sort of do them as a gr like this so you do them as an exclusive and then gr afterwards so as you can tell this is like a regular air force one but it's got an addition of like this elite's metal um, little tablet here little um, hardware sorry where the eyelets are but the really defining factor of it is the front so the front usually in air force one you have like another panel here but they've made it kind of kind of one piece but not really but you know so it's kind of like an invisible it's kind of one piece here on the midfoot all the way to the front and you've got the toe box so in you will you will eventually see this shape or this style of an air force one soon because they've done it you know limited edition with uh, matthew williams first and then everyone else is going to get it as you can see here with this particular one you've got the fucking air force one front panel thing missing so most likely you'll see this particular Air Force One sans the Elite's hardware be available as a GR somewhere down the line. So I'm assuming these particular models 
are the GR version, and then this green or this green olive one with the swoosh at the front and the fucking different tag as well on the back at the back is the Nigel Sylvester Pro model exclusive sort of like one. But either way, the GRs or the exclusive ones, they're all fucking hard. Um, is there a date on these yet at the moment? I didn't think I saw a date. Um, what, weirdly enough, look at the price. Actually, I'm actually surprised. One fifty dollars. That's actually quite good. I thought they were gonna do them for like two hundred something crazy, but one fifty is really good to be fair. And they're meant to be released sometime in on July third, allegedly. Allegedly, they're meant to be released in, on July third. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting a pair myself. There's also a video here showing him skating around. You can check out if you want to see yourself. But yeah, the Nigel Sylvester and Jordans. Um, or oh, the Nigel Sylvester Air Jordan 4 RM Really nice I wonder what the RM stands for Not really too sure But regardless They look fucking hard I love everything about them And I can't wait For them to release And drop Very 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 Soon Anyways my friends That has been The Agassino's English Show Episode number 780 Thank you so much for tuning in It's been a pleasure to have your company As per usual If you have enjoyed This particular show and you want to see more of it why don't you leave me a five-star review five-star review helps people to see the show help sponsors and advertisers especially apple and amazon the ones only ones i want i'm not gonna fucking be pushing athletic greens or anything on here anytime soon but hopefully it'll get me spotted by the fucking eaten apple by the half eaten apple and it might get me spotted by the most um you know toxic <laughs> um environmentally damaging company in the world which is amazon but those are the ones i'll fucking accept so if you want to help me out definitely make sure you leave me a five-star review on the apple podcast or anywhere you listen to podcasts i'd be greatly appreciated spotify all that sort of shit links to my socials you can find in the description and today for my tune of the day to exit you and to leave you guys in a good place i'm gonna play a track from the incredible album courtesy of Ghana, which is one of one i need to actually do a review of this on the pod overall but the album itself is just such a banger that i think you should check it out and listen to it anyway he definitely has proved that even though he doesn't have the grace and friendship of these hip-hop guys anymore because of the alleged snitching thing everyone's kind of left him on his own he's definitely a talent he's definitely shown um contrary to what little baby has shown that he doesn't need cosigns he doesn't need features he can create whole bodies of work um by himself at a very high level and he can continually keep evolving his sound like he's he's just skating across this entire fucking album every track is a banger like there's just so many on there it's hard to really pick out a favorite but i'm obviously going to play you my favorite or the one that i want to play today and my favorite today that i want to play for you guys is track number 12 um from gunner's album one of one um the track is blackjack that's going to be my tune of the day today so thank you for tuning into the exit zinger show episode number 780 this is gunner blackjack me signing out peace